Hi everyone, and welcome to this live stream. I'm doing another one of my Von Art interview series, and today I'm doing the wonderful and the super nice. You're, actually, I describe you as one of the nicest artists I've ever met. I don't know if you know this, <laughs> but I'm interviewing Corey Godby. So Hello. thank you, hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining, and I, yeah. I'm very <laughs> curious to learn more about you, and I know I... I told you before, I only know about the past five years of Corey's work and portfolio, but you've already let me know that you have a lot to show, and I'm very excited about that. So to get started, do you want to just say who you are and a little thing about yourself? Uh, yeah, so I'm Corey Godby. Um, I've been doing illustration. Um, I, I got started when I was 16 doing textbook illustration. Um, from there, I moved into... Uh, doing book covers and doing other publishing work. Um, mm -hmm. And then I've been doing it full time since uh, 2000, 2005. And uh, so it's just, wow. uh, it's just kind of what I, what I've always done. Um, and uh, yeah, over the years I've had the chance to work on a bunch of, a um, bunch of really great projects, a uh, bunch of bad ones too. Um, I, I always never <laughs> feel like, you know, like you could go on an actor like IMDb page and see every single thing they've ever done. It's like I'm mm -hmm. not that one for illustration because there's a bunch of these things that I just need to just let them. They're lost to the wind. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I've had a chance to work on a bunch of fun things over the years. Um, everything from uh, I worked on some uh, commercial work, uh, some uh, documentary films, um, done you know things for Jim Henson Company, Disney, mm -hmm. bunch of stuff like that, Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and. Um, Bunch of things that uh, have been very creatively fulfilling. Um, done some writing as well over the years, and so it's kind of a variety of projects, everything from comics to animation to uh, publishing. Um, and then on top of that, all my own uh, personal work. So kind of a uh -huh. bunch of different bunch of different things over the years. Which I'm sure at some point I'm going to ask you just a little. You know, a little sneak peek at maybe where you're at with your personal. I don't need to see images. I just want to make sure it's being done. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's like you know, and there's all different like like facets to the personal work. Like there's the writing mm -hmm. stuff that you and I have talked about some in the past, um, and then there's uh, what I when I uh, produce my annual sketchbooks uh, because I've found over the years that that's one way that really keeps me on doing work for myself because it's. Uh, what I found is it's very easy to just sort of be swept up in doing everything for everybody else and then not doing work uh, for myself. And so the sketchbooks um, really keep me doing that. And then the writing stuff is kind of a whole separate thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that. Well, I know I'm sure a lot of people watching will want to know more about like that balance between freelance and your personal work. So I'm... So I guess for anyone that's watching right now, if you want to ask Corey a question, the way that I always structure these is I ask every artist 10 questions and then we go into Instagram questions that I got over the week and then we will get into your questions. So I'm going to, if you ever hear me typing, it's not like I'm working on something else. I'm literally typing up questions that people have and then I'll get to them at the end. Yeah. So be sure to put at Von Art before your question. That way I can see it really easily and add it to it. So to get started, Corey, let's jump into the 10 questions right away. So the first one, growing up, when did art seem to grab your attention? Uh, that's that's uh, a, a really good one. Um, and it's one that like, I don't know if I have like a really distinct answer for because it mm. it honestly feels like it's kind of always been there. Like I, like God bless my mom. She let me just draw on my walls. Um, really? <laughs> like, this was, this once, once you kind of realize that Corey liked to draw, they reached a point where like, eh, she just kind of let me do it. Um, wow. And so I would draw a crayon on my walls um, and I, and she would let me um, cover my door with stickers and like drawings and like, so I had all like, it's one of the things that like, I love giving like at conventions or something like when, when a little kid gets a postcard, you know, it's like not everybody can buy a print, not everybody, you know, wants a sketchbook or something, but like little kids will take postcards. And I always, mm -hmm. uh, I always think of this one kid who came, uh, his mom came up to me and was like, you know, can, he wants to look at your banner. At the, at the time, it was this big, um, this big like fish creature, uh, and and he, his mom said, "Can he come look at that?" I'm like, "Sure." And so he got on a little stair, his little ch little chair. He got up, looked at the right in the face for about <laughs> 20 seconds, which is kind of a long time. 
And then just like turned to me, he was like maybe four, turned to me, said, thank you, got down, walked away. And I remember doing that kind of stuff when I was really little, um, you know, staring at um, like drawings of Ninja Turtles or like, <laughs> Oh, like all kinds of different stickers and things that I had on my door and just kind of like not having the vocabulary to describe what I found so compelling about the images, but wanting to mm -hmm. like absorb it. And and I couldn't describe it that way then. And I'm, I can feel like I can barely like explain it now even, <laughs> but just like seeing something that just like kind of got me in a way that I couldn't describe. Um, and then uh, when I was I was five and in kindergarten, and I remember this really vividly, we had to um, draw a picture of what we wanted to be when we grew up. Uh, it was like a oh, little yeah. class project thing. Um, and I remember sitting there just like looking at the paper and thinking like, like, I got no idea. Like, what this is, this is, this is too much, <laughs> too big of a question for me. And I remember just starting to draw and I was, I was like, well, I'll draw a cop. I'll draw like a cop and I drew like an old timey, like movie cop kind of hat yeah. with like a badge on it. And I remember sitting and looking back and thinking like, that looks, that looks really good. And I had this little epiphany, like, I'm not going to be a cop. Can't do that, but I can draw things. And really ever since then, um, sort of my abiding memory of elementary school age was just drawing in my uh, like notebooks and kind of glancing up and realizing like I'm not following where everybody else is. Yeah. And then just kind of getting back into my drawings. And so, you know, actually I had a teacher in fourth grade, uh, talk to my mom once and she's like, I cannot get him to stop drawing all he like, that's all he's doing in class. I can't get him to stop. Yeah. And, um, fast forward, you know, maybe 20 some years later, the, that teacher got in touch and said, um, never mind. Like I apologize, because <laughs> like, it's you know it's just what um I don't know it's it's like the it's the I feel a little like a one trick pony like that's what I can do I can draw things, um and well, so it's kind of all all that to say that's that's where kind of I feel like it it's started in childhood is just this thing I couldn't escape, and it's it's the one thing that I I that feels as natural as like breathing to me, yeah. Well, and now look at you now, you're a full-time cop. So the dream actually came full circle. <laughs> That's the real irony of the whole thing. I don't even have a hat. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. No, that was great. I think, yeah, I think a lot of us kind of, you know, have that intuition when we're younger. And yeah. then kind of like what we mentioned before the stream started, you kind of get labeled as the best draw or the best artist in the class. Right. So I right. assume that was you all through grade school. Yeah, yeah, kind of all, you know, if there was ever like a like a poster or like some class project or mm -hmm. like, you know, we're like making a thing and it's going to be for whatever for the school. Uh, I feel like that all that all like culminated in high school. Um, I got to paint the the backdrop like set for like the, the senior play. Oh, be out of class for like a week. And all I had to do, they, they set me up with all these big panels and I just had all paints and all this stuff. And I just had a week for that's all I did. I'm like, it, this is this is all led to this, and, and this is uh, this is where I want to be. That's a quite a short deadline just for exposure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in the play too. That's, oh, were that's you it. really? I was in the play. I, I, I played played the doctor um, doing something. <laughs> I forget what. I can't remember the name of it. So you've been an artist, a cop, and a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> um, been, also, you're getting compliments on your beautiful facial hair. Just so you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know. Once, once that started, I'm like, well, this is just where we're at now. <laughs> not not trimming this. All right, so now we jump into the probably the most fun part for me to see, and it's the can we see some work from three, five, ten, fifteen, and twenty years ago? Yes. Okay. So let me let me pull this up. I am so uh, curious to see your work. Yeah. So uh, how would you like? Would you like me to start? Uh, with like recent stuff and work back, or do you want me to start like at the at the furthest thing I have, and then kind of like you know what move. I'll do dealer's choice because I've seen both on these okay. interviews now, and they both are kind of fun to watch. Okay, let me let me pull up. Uh, here we go. Okay, 
All right, so if everybody can see this, um, I'm going to go ahead. I'll just start at, you know what, let's start at the end. Yeah, let's or start at the beginning. beginning. The, the beginning, that I think is the most interesting. So this, this right here is the oldest <laughs> can that I have. This is a little comic that I made um, when I was in fourth grade. I had these little creatures that I would draw, these little like puffball things with eyes. And so this... I, I, I can understand what's happening in the comic because I remember making it, but you, you see, you've got this 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 strong looking fella here. He's saying, I got you now. And then there's something this guy is trying to say, look behind you. And then somehow this little guy appears pouring a potion on him that turns him into an alligator. <laughs> and then it wears off and he gets, he gets super strong again. <laughs> and the guy goes, ah, mommy. And that's the oldest thing that I have in this game. There might be other things, but that's that's it. That's, that's fourth grade Corey. You know, however old you are in fourth grade. But like, What's Tabor mean? It was the name of the little like creature, the little like oh okay, little like puffball fuzzy guy. Or is it like, Tabor? Uh, I I always called it Tabor. Okay, Tabor. But, yeah, this this little like little fella. Um, so yeah. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. what? Okay, so that's that's kind of the oldest like childhood drawing that I have a scan of. Uh, what I'm going to go through now is this is some of the stuff. Um, as I said before, I got started when I was 16 doing textbook illustrations. So this is mm -hmm. this is some stuff that I don't think anybody's ever seen because I've never I've never had any reason to post any of this anywhere. I just I knew I had some of it. And so I went back and I looked some of it up. Um, so let me just pull up some of these here. Um, okay, so yeah, this is like Cat and this guy. This guy was a guy who worked at the publishing company, like the printer. Um, I never knew his name. I just liked the way he looked. He was <laughs> like this, this sort of like little mustache fellow with glasses and I drew him in everything if I could get away with it. Um, and my supervisor once was like, Hey, is that such, is, is that Richard or whoever? And uh, I was like, uh, yes. And he goes, it's really funny, but you have to stop. <laughs> Cause I would put that guy into everything. Uh, but this is some of the stuff I used to do. Um, I don't remember what this was for. This was like something, I don't know. Um, and then some of it, some of it, it was better than others. This was like some Romeo and Juliet kind of <laughs> spot <laughs> illustration thing. Um, this, and it, uh, you know, at the time I got started, um, kind of pre Photoshop cause this was 1999. Oh, wow. Uh, and so this was, this was all like, like chalk pastel kind of stuff here. Um, and then eventually like they, one day they brought in a bunch of computers and then everybody was like. All right, we're gonna learn. Um, we're gonna learn for Photoshop. So that's where some of that stuff is. This is probably my favorite drawing that I did uh, during my 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 time as a textbook illustrator. It's a cat and a fiddle thing. Yeah. Um, and so then this is just some other stuff from that same kind of time period. Um, this is probably all like ninety nine, two thousand, maybe two thousand one. Um, this is just some Ooh. pretty pretty old stuff. Look at that one. Man, so even back then you had such like strong sense of design and shape. And even your color work is pretty strong. I thought your earlier work may have been like all of us, where we have like work that we don't want people to see. But yours <laughs> is like still pretty a whole lot more stuff great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, and I, I feel fortunate in that, you know, I kind of hit on what I wanted to do, I feel like pretty, pretty early. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, so this stuff is, Ooh. if you've been around, like, on the internet for a while, I guess, they might have seen some of this, because this is all from, uh, let's see, this would have been, like, 2005, 2009, like, this was all kind of, um, um, I guess 15 years ago, uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, and this was the first piece. I was always proud of this one. <laughs> was the first one that ever got into uh, the Society of Illustrators annual. Oh, really? Yeah, this sort of stuff. 
Oh, I can definitely still see you in all of this. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. There, there's a lot of just sort of recurring stuff, I guess, for me. Um, and um, this this was what I always liked, sort of like very silly opera stuff. Wow. This kind of stuff. So you don't really have like that awkward deviant art stage because even um, I was like with with Pete, he was showing his like deviant art days, and it was kind of like this awkward puberty era of an artist <laughs> where you're not really at your style yet, but you're kind of experimenting. It seems like I can see you in all of this. Well, I I appreciate that. It's it's nice to think because you know when when you said to to find things that were like you know from. 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah. A, a lot of this stuff, it's funny to see like what bleeds through and like what's, what's sort of the, uh, maybe the sort of the connective tissue between eras, I guess. Um, because, you know, this is now all from five years ago. Um, this is, mm. um, and then this is some of the, uh, a little bit of the Jim Henson stuff, the storyteller. So I was so oh, proud of how so rainy that looked and, and left nice room for the title. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of this kind of stuff. But yeah, this this is all uh, probably 2014, 2015, uh, this kind of stuff. But, um, so oh, God, I love this color palette. Your stuff always has like this golden warmth to it. I always just feel warm looking at your work. Yeah, that's it's um, and it's like it's either it's either that or it's just gonna be cold and blue is what I've noticed over the years. <laughs> like I, even I, your I, cold I, stuff, you have warm. this like warmth to it. Um, I don't know because it's you know I, I love all those golden age fantasy illustrators, the, the you know Rackham and Bauer, like those. Mm -hmm. that, you know where my head is at most of the time um and so that's kind of the the sort of stuff that i'm most drawn to um so yeah that would be all like five years ago and then let's see so this kind of get through this quickly um, well this is where you can kind of show off because this, yeah, this, this, this is more of the the recent stuff <laughs> this is all within the last year um within the mm. last um, and then, you know, some of the Dark Crystal stuff, which, you know, is, I mean, really like uh, an absolute dream to get to work on this stuff. Um, it was just so fun. And um, right, 40, uh, over the course of like four of the novels, there's about 40 uh, black and white interior illustrations for these things. Um, Well, like, I'm sure I want to ask you later about how that relationship even started. So I know a lot of people are probably curious, like, how do you get in contact with these big companies? Yeah, yeah. this this was um, this kind of stuff started um, again. It was it was sort of like a, being in the right place at the right time, I feel like, um, mm -hmm. you know, I had done um, I had done a story that was part of a comics anthology um, that um, a guy, a writer at the Henson Company happened to pick up that anthology, saw my work in it. Oh. And at the time they were producing um, new Fraggle stuff, um, which this would have been, you know, uh, like 2008. Wait, wait is, that, is it the flight book? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's flight. Hey. It was, yeah. Yeah. So he, he had picked that up. Uh, it was flight six was the first one I was in. Uh -huh. That's one with Justin Gerard as well, correct? Uh, I think he was in seven. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, I think I think it was seven, seven or eight. I forget. I was, there was six, seven, and eight was were the ones that I was in. Um, but yeah, this this guy uh, who's a writer there um, happened to pick it up, happened to see it and at the time. They're doing Fraggle stuff and said, "Hey, this this guy should draw some Fraggles." And so um, I had to do a few like character tests, and then after that, um, I did a Fraggle story, uh, which then led on to me doing um, some Labyrinth stuff, which. This is some of the most recent Labyrinth stuff. This was for the uh, the prequel um, comic. This is like a big, uh, like, uh, they used it as a set of four covers, kind of, you could lay the, the lay them side by side to make up, you know, the one big piece. It was like a big um, thing like that. 
Oh, that's yeah. great. A lot of dark crystal stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, this and this is the most mm -hmm. recent thing. I finished this like a week or two ago. Um, we covered her eye. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, no, it was always like that. Yeah, it was like that from the drawing. Um, and if you ever met me at a convention, this is my uh, banner. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and um, yep, so lots of creatures. I like big, big kind of clunky troll creatures. Um, you know, I David Peterson. I I know you're familiar with him. I, mm -hmm. One time he, he told me that all of my um, my uh, animals and creatures look like they're about to give a lost traveler good advice. <laughs> it's the best compliment I've ever been given. Uh, I I just I just love that. Oh, um, that is like everything you draw looks like it's just made of hair. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> furry and you know made of uh, made of hair. So actually, speaking of David Peterson, he's in the chat right now. Ah, uh, says... David Peterson. He says you well, love greens. Even when he goes warm, he sneaks green in there. <laughs> David, David's a, David's the smartest person I know. That guy. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that guy. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So that's. Oh, and then this. This is the cover of. Actually, you have it uh, behind you. That's the cover of my uh, my sketchbook anthology. So what? What? Um. What I'm always uh, proud about this one is. Since it's it's uh, the the hardcover collects five of my sketchbooks, mm -hmm. um, each of the five sketchbooks are represented in this cover, uh, and so that's kind of a kind oh. of a thing I hope to um, to keep going for the second sketchbook collection, which should be next year because this year, um, let's see, because th this this collects twenty eleven to twenty fifteen, and then I've got sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Uh, yeah, 2020. So once I finish up this one, yeah, um, yeah. So um, I had no idea. That's like a cool little Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. That um, that's that's where kind of the idea for that whole cover came from. I wanted it to be something that would um, kind of represent uh, one part of each of the five sketchbooks, and so you, know, you could kind of look through the different yeah. sketchbooks in the anthology and kind of pick out like who represents what and like what it's. Uh, what what they're for? So, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where uh, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. I, there's a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I guess I probably do have some more like awkward stage digital stuff where I'm kind of like figuring out. I don't know rendering, <laughs> you know, like that that kind of stuff. I mean, um, did you just I, cherry pick the ones that you thought were? Good? I did. <laughs> well, at least it's my favorite ones. Because there's also there's tons of stuff you just, you just forget about. I mean, oh yeah, back through like old hard drives, pulling a few things out for this, and like I, I I've forgotten about tons of this stuff. Um, some of it's worse than others, but you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah I guess I should also make mention to those watching. If you want to look through the book and buy one yourself, I did put a link in the description. Oh man. Okay. Well, of course I'm going to promo you. <laughs> well, okay. you. So then, actually, this goes into our next question. What, Which piece do you think defines your growth and progress the most from seeing yourself as an amateur artist to a more professional one? So what was your, like, the one that tied it or the, the, the bridge between the two? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so there's, I feel like there's, there's, like, a lot of different little bridges along the ways. Um, along the way and certain pieces that you just kind of like something clicks and like you figure mm -hmm. something out that you didn't have before or like something that you were really struggling with that for you know you you've kind of gotten yourself to the stage now where you, you can do the thing that you mean to do um, and I think one of those would be uh, that piece it was in it was in the folder there uh, the dragon sitting on the hill blowing the dandelions yes um that one um was one of the first pieces i did um when i was out of school and i felt like okay this is where i want to head with my work like this this is the first thing that i've done that i feel like has something um 
And I was, I, I'm, I'm, I still, I look at that. And I'm like, I see all of the little troubles with it. Uh, <laughs> 15 or more years old, but I look at it and it's, I, I see it as a, as a, a significant stepping stone. Mm -hmm. um, that one. And then there was another one that I actually didn't put in the collection. Uh, it was one that uh, I did. It's in my 2013 sketchbook. It's in the, that hardcover collection. Um, and uh, it's the one that I, I won a spectrum award for. Um, it's actually the one where um, it's like a big fish creature and it's all kind of Is it green. playing the instrument. Um, what was that? Is it the one where it has like sea kelp or it looks like seaweed? Uh, yeah, it's like a big kind of kelpy undersea yes. sort of creature. There's some little like mermaid sort of figures with him. Um, and, and that one's always been really special to me because I won the award for it. Um, and then it also, that was one that um, when the art director was pitching me to do these dark crystal prequel books, which would then go on to become the Netflix show, that was the piece. He was like, send me the high res of that one because that's what I'm putting into the my, my materials that I'm sending. Because um, at the time I had been doing some labyrinth stuff uh, and like Fraggle stuff and Storyteller stuff. Uh, but I, what I really wanted to do was dark crystal. Um, and so- Really? Over labyrinth? The, yeah, like Dark Crystal, um, I it's like it. I just adore that world. I love how living and alive the world feels. Uh, this complete, you know, cohesive thing that's yeah. just not like anything else. And so, Dark Crystal was the one I, I was really wanting to do. Um, and so that that piece led into doing the novels. Um, and so, yeah, there's just. Uh, I can I can trace a really direct line between most every significant um, client project um, back to some piece of personal work. Almost any any um, significant thing I've gotten to do, there's usually uh, a really short line back to some art director, creative director, editor. Somebody saw some piece that I had done that was just for me. That yeah. they're like, well, that's what we want for this. And so, you know, you can. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's great advice because I think a lot of younger artists always wonder, how do I get seen? So it's good to hear that sometimes it's a personal piece that will get you noticed, you know, more than anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what I found. I mean, you know, um, I'm really proud of a lot of the, the stuff I've gotten to do, um, but it really still seems to be that it's the personal stuff that, that attracts the most attention. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and just so you know, we do have some questions from Instagram that I got about the new Netflix series on Dark Crystal. So we'll get oh, yeah. to that eventually because I okay. think a lot of them are like, favorite character, yeah. what do you think? But we'll get to those after these. Oh, because I'm, I'm also personally curious to hear about uh, those answers too. But uh, I guess you kind of answered this, but I don't know, maybe there is a different one. Is The next question is, is there a piece that you have a personal connection that stands out amongst the rest is like a personal favorite? Oh man. Um... There's always the ones that like you really, I don't know, you you really love for one reason or another that yeah. don't get attention. Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, or like you you think like, oh, I'm gonna make prints of this, and then, eh, nobody wants it, and you, you can't tell like, yep. who, like why is one thing gonna work and one thing is not gonna work. Um, and um, so I know there's there's a couple pieces. Um, there was the one in particular. There's one that I I just really love like. I can pull it back up real quick. Um, I think if unless I've just forgotten how to do this all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, it's uh, this one. Mm. Um, this one has never really been too popular, uh, at least as far as like prints. I don't think I ever sold any prints of it. Um, oh. It's really simple. Um, not a lot going on, but I'm just, it's one that I just really love. It just kind of captures something that I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I try to approach with my work and, um, I don't know, it's, it's very, very, uh, very Bauer, I guess. Um, so I mean, maybe it kind of leans on my, my influences too much. Um, but that one, I, I really, I have a lot of affection for that one. I feel um, like you have to enlighten me. What does Dower mean? Oh, sorry. Uh, John Bauer. Oh. <laughs> right. That's it. Dower. Like my Wisconsin uh, ignorance is coming out yeah. here. <laughs> I don't know what he just said. 
no, no. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, and I think the the banner piece um, again is one that like doesn't really sell as print, uh, but it's yeah. one that I just I don't know. I have a lot of a, a lot of uh, affection for it. Um, yeah, that uh, was great. I love all your big your big creature stuff. Really does have a heart to it. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I should have I should have pulled up one that I, I have that kind of the first one of those big creatures I ever drew. Um, I saw it when I was going through all these old files and I did pull the... <laughs> you so, didn't cherry pick that one. You're like, you ah. Just imagine it. You can just imagine that it's really, really <laughs> nice. It's just lost in a hard drive somewhere. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, there, there's always certain ones that you have, you have a lot of, I don't know, either some memory of working on it or... You know, you, you reached some, some, you kind of feel like you reach a level where, uh, or even like there's, there's a handful of things I'm working on right now where I feel like this is something I would have struggled like to the point of just complete frustration even two or three years ago. And now I'm just getting through it. Um, and it's just, and you, you know, you, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been um, uh, a, a long process of getting to the point where um you can you can just get into stuff and work on it and you know like you get frustrated here and there but like you the successes keep coming rather than um you are just feel completely frustrated by like where you're at um yeah. i always think of this one bugaro quote um i'll ruin it but like the gist of it is you know like how how sad is it to have your idea ruined by poor execution Ooh, yeah. And, you know, like you have this thing that you're trying to approach, this thing you're trying to uh, to say or show or, you know, some feeling you're trying to like give and you just can't do it because like you, you, you just like your technical abilities aren't meeting up with what you want to do. And so yeah. for me, it's been a, a, a long, long ongoing process of trying to improve my visual vocabulary and, and build my voice and keep working on things to where I can kind of let myself get out of the way so I can then work on and show what I mean to do. So so tailing yeah. off of that, because I have I have a piece that I have sitting in my corner right now that I haven't touched in about a year and a half because I thought I did such a good job on one section and I was like, I don't think I'm good enough to finish this yet. Have yeah. you ever done that where you started a piece, but you really liked it? And you're like, I don't know if I can match that technical we're, prowess. It's, it's, <laughs> so, okay. So yeah, like case in point, I don't know if it'll show up that well on the screen, but like that, oh, that yeah. one piece, uh, this was the original drawing was a part of my 2017 sketchbook. Oh, three years I ago. Got the, I got the, this like under drawing sketch done. It was like, I don't have time to finish this before I run. I need to get this book to print. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I could draw it the way I want to do it, but I know I can get like the, the parts of it down, but I don't know that I could actually do this the way I mean it to. Yeah. And so, um, last month I was like, well, feels right. Just pulled it out and sat down and just did it. And, um, you know, isn't that funny how that weird. works? Yeah. And there's, there's a drawing, um, that's in that same sketchbook, 2017, that uh, I had never sold a drawing um, from another one of my collections um, that just wasn't, it was a weak drawing, but it, it just wasn't, kind of did its job then, but it wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And I went back, found my original reference and just worked it over, changed parts, and then included that in my uh, the 2017 sketchbook. And so uh, there's another piece I'm working on right now that's a drawing from, um, 2016. So I mean, that's going, that's <laughs> four years ago um, that at the time, like I was pleased with it. Uh, it was for the sketchbook. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I, I, I pick a hard deadline for getting these sketchbooks done every year. It's usually a convention. It'll be like, yeah. you know, I want to have this in hand by New York comic con, or I want to have it in hand by, you know, whatever. Uh, because then that, that kind of puts an actual real world deadline on it. So it's not just this mm -hmm. thing that I can let go on for forever. Um, so you do run out of time and and uh, get to the point where, you know, I'm doing um, 
doing drawings that I know I will hope to come back, hope to come back and finish this. Um, yeah. yeah, I have that one that I'm working on now is probably the oldest one. It's four years and I, I, it, I can feel like as I'm working on it, I can see all the things that I struggled with then. Like, it, it, it's like, I don't know, I'm trying to think, it's like, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, it's rattling. Like, it, it's like a car that's like, it's just able to drive. And yeah. it's like, just working, like it works. And it, it, it's, you can go somewhere with it. But I'm having to do a ton of work while it's rolling to, to bring this piece yes. from four years ago up to where I want it now. And so it's, it's a lot of like, you know, I'm not changing too much of the figures, but I'm like, rendering a ton and stuff that like, I wouldn't have just been able to do four years ago. So it's it's satisfying to to see those those progressions where you feel like I I figured things out in a way that I didn't even know that I I had figured out I until you, you like put the pencil down to the paper. You don't know that what you know. I guess I don't, I don't know if that sounds like nuts. It's just kind of great to hear that other people do that like this isn't a weird yeah. bizarre thing that artists do where they might just put a piece down for not even just a week or a month but like years yeah. you know yeah yeah it's like i i got i got what i wanted to do there and i know right now i cannot take this further mm -hmm. um, and i just have to wait and i don't i don't think that's always wrong i i, I mean I'm, I'm a big believer in spending your ideas because that's how you get more ideas um I but like i think that. there's another side to that where you know, you don't always, you can't always do what you mean to do right then. And so it's, it can be easy, I think, to kind of like use that as an excuse um, to be like, well, I'm not ready yet, so I'm not going to do anything. Like, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I like that little gold nugget of advice, though. What was it? You have to, it's, what was it, spend ideas to get new ideas? Uh, yeah, yeah. I heard that from uh, Kazuo Kibuishi, who is the editor on the Flight Comics Oh. Um, and Amulet is his really super successful graphic novel series. Uh, he did like the, um, I think it was, it was the 10th or 15th anniversary Harry Potter edition covers. Oh. Um, and I just remember him saying that once that like, that's how you get new ideas is you spend ideas. Uh, you can't, you can't be too precious with it. Can't hold on to it for too long. I love uh, that. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's a hundred percent true. Uh, that in, is. in my experiences, I found that, yeah. You have to just do it, put it out, and that's how you spark new ideas. Well, and it's funny when people hold on to ideas for too long. Oftentimes, not a lot of production is happening, and they're not able to produce a lot. So then they're right. just holding on to, oh no, just wait and see. Like I have something big coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. No, I like that. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Next question is, how do you hope people see your work? Oh goodness. I mean. Um... <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I just I feel incredibly fortunate that people respond to it, and I feel fortunate that uh, people respond to it enough that I can keep doing it. Um, mm, I, like I do. Uh, I I feel like I can never tell how somebody's going to react to a piece. Um, I can only try to do do it honestly and do do the sort of work that I want to see. Um, and then uh, however people react to it, I guess is how they react to it. I feel like uh, we're in a mine right now. Cause you were just digging up gold, the draw work that you want to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's, um, it's just, it's the sort of stuff that I want to see in the world. And so, um, yeah. No, that's, that's great. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. How, I hope, hope, hope people react to it. Um, like one thing I like to do, I feel like I've been given a, um, a lot of gifts when when somebody does something and then it sparks an idea for me or I kind of see it um, like a like an imaginative springboard. Like I can yeah. move on, take this idea that makes me think of this and I can move on to the next thing. And if I can do that for somebody else, then I feel like I've I've done a big part of what uh, is important for me is providing something that's going to then give somebody an idea for their own work. Um, yes. that's when I get the most out of stuff. When I see something that makes me think of something new I want to do, or like, you know, solve some problem that I've been kind of like mulling over, um, some creative thing like that's, 
that's what I get from from uh, people's work, and so that's what I, I hope I can give, um, and give some new paths to explore. Yeah, no, I love that. I was once told that as artists, we're passing the baton between the generation of artists of the shoulders that we stand on, and then to the next generation. And yeah. then in the passing is us creating hopefully a new uh, new work that hasn't been seen yet, or it's you know original yeah. in its own right. So yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So now how do you balance the dual life of running a business and creating, but without monetary intention? So art that is purely for yourself. A uh, big part of that is the sort of it's, I mean, I guess it's separation between my personal work and client stuff. Although, you know, there tends to be overlap because, um, you know, it's the, the client stuff attracts or personal stuff attracts client stuff. And then, you know, some of the client stuff feels like personal work. Um, you know, as far as this, the work I do for myself, uh, that's purely just, I, I pick a theme, I pick an idea, and I build out a new series on that theme every year. And so I'll kind of take one idea and, you know, I might be mm. looser with it, more stricter with it, but um, I'll kind of take that and just kind of turn the idea around and around and try and see all the sides of it. And that kind of helps me build out a new collection. Um, and so that's just work that, I mean, if I can make prints out of it, that's great. I've had whole sketchbooks where I really didn't have anything that I had originals, um, but I didn't have any, you know, nothing that really worked as a print or like a standalone kind of piece. Um, you know, that's happened over the years. Um, ideally, like when it's, when that whole thing is working really well, like you've created a set of originals that, um, collectors would want. Um, and you've gotten a set of, you know, new pieces that you can turn into prints that might be uh, successful. And then you've gotten um, attracted attention with the, the new work. And so, I mean, the, one of the sketchbooks that by, by, by all those metrics that's been the most successful was the 2012 sketchbook, uh, Menagerie. It's in that, um, collected in that hardcover. Ah. Um, it's yeah, in that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I sold every single piece from Whoa. that collection. Um, there was a, I uh, sold a bunch of individual ones and then there was a gallery in Paris that just said, what do you have left and bought probably 20 or 30 of the drawings from it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the one that's brought in a ton of work over the years. A lot of clients have referenced it. Um, and it's just had, uh, each of the pieces and it just kind of worked as a standalone print. So, you know, that one really, really worked. Um, and then others have either been more creatively fulfilling or, you know, um, I don't know if you can see this cat. Oh no. <laughs> With the tail going by. Uh, but, you know, they might be more creatively fulfilling or they might, they might be something that just like, I'm wanting, to, I just have to like get out. Yeah. Uh, that's not really going to have, too many opportunities for prints or like stuff that I can like, you know, monetize in that way. Um, so, you know, and I'm, and I'm fortunate that my client stuff stays steady to where I, I, I don't feel like I'm, I can keep my personal work just as its own thing. And I don't feel too much pressure to, you know, well, if I, if I did this, this would make this a better piece yeah. for a print. Or, you know, so I, I don't know. It's it's tricky because I feel like if I did, I wouldn't be able to guess what people would want. Um, I couldn't like anticipate how people would react or like what people would want to see. And so, you know, I'd just be like running in circles trying to like anticipate what I should do and then yes. kind of feel paralyzed by like options. And so uh, the best thing I can do for myself is to just just do the work I want to see and then just let it fall. Honestly, I think this is something that more artists need to hear because especially when me and a lot of my friends went into the convention scene, right. art that we created from that point forward was very much catered to being prints. And I yeah. think so much of what, especially now even younger than when we started, I'm talking like late teens, early 20s, everyone's making art that can then be turned into a print. So it's this weird mindset where art's no longer from creating like how you are saying, or you just, you want to create it. You want to make what you want to see. And I feel that uh, some younger artists, I, it, it's just unfortunate where they feel they have to 
create work that could also be turned into something that has a monetary value on it. And it's something that I need people to hear when you say it's like, don't create work for that intention, you know, still create work for yourself first. And then if you can monetize it, then you can play that game. Yeah. I feel like it's, that's, that's going to come from the most honest place and whether or not you can like put your finger on why I think people will pick up on, you know, work that's done that, that feels like this is the thing I think I'm going to sell a ton of prints of. It's all well and good. I mean, like if you can do it, go ahead and do it. I guess. I mean, I, 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 no problem. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, you only can do the most purest of pure arts like that. <laughs> really, um, like do what you got to do. <laughs> No, but like, I, I think that is good advice, though. You know, I yeah. think too many of us, especially the people that I'm always surrounded with and talking with, we're too consumed with making products. And yeah. I always say that the art age that we live in right now currently is commercialism because everything that you create has to have some kind of a purpose, whether it's monetary or for marketing yeah. purposes. So mm -hmm. it's good to hear that, you know, there's artists that like yourself that are still creating just because you want to create. And I think a lot of us forget that a lot of the reasons we got into art was because it was our way of relaxing or unwinding or escaping yeah. reality, whatever it might be. And like right. finding that again, that pure like joy that drawing gives us, I think is, is really, you know, something that we shouldn't forget. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah good job. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Actually, this totally leads into the next question, which is how has art defined who you've become? I mean, it, I, when I saw that question, I was like, I don't even know how to answer this because <laughs> it's just all encompassing. <laughs> like nope. it's just, it's just the, it's like, it's just in my water supply. Like it's just what, what I do. It's all I've ever really done. I mean, I, um, you know, like going back to when I was really little, I just like to draw. I like to draw, I like to go outside. And I had a bunch of woods um, and I like played Nintendo and that's kind of like what I did. Um, and then go, like, even now that's kind of still just what I do, except I have three children. And so I drag them along with me, um, yeah. you know, to do, to do all these things. Um, and so, you know, as far as like, how has it defined me or, or, you know, I mean, it's just kind of, it's just what I do. Um, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I feel like I can't even, I don't know. I, I feel like I don't have a great answer for it because it's just so, just so ever present. Like I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm almost never not thinking about either, whether it's something for like a client project or something for myself, there's always something that I'm doing that's kind of pushing towards uh my work and so yeah i i don't know i i i feel like i've dropped the ball on the answer here um, oh no i mean <laughs> people in the chat are saying he is art <laughs> it's hard to answer when you are art i guess follow up then how has art helped you in the department of law enforcement yeah <laughs> real bad it does not work the, the, the two don't mix Okay, so now getting into now talking to the other artists that are watching right now, what is the best advice to an artist just starting out? And then the best advice to an artist who is struggling with where they're at. So, you know, people that are just getting, you know, they're, right. they're like 18 or maybe younger actually now, like 12. Yeah. And then maybe someone that's like mid 20s and they're struggling with where they're at. They can't find their style. Yeah. Um, I One thing that... I feel like helped me a lot, a, hand, a handful of things. I'm just going to kind of ramble my way yeah. through them. Um, the one years and years ago, um, honestly, I think it was Justin told me to just put in your portfolio the kind of work you want to do. Don't show everything you can do. I think that would apply more for like a, a younger artist. I mean, that, that at this point, that may be just like common knowledge, but I feel like it's helpful for me because, you know, there's a lot of different things that I like to do and there's a lot of different things that I feel like I can do, but there's, um, some of that kind of gets in the way of like the focus of where I really want my work to go. Um, so there's, there, there's, there's that. 
Um, the other thing is, and I think this applies to to um, a, a younger artist and somebody who may feel stuck where they're at at any level. Um, this is something that I that I've found over the years, uh, and it's the sketchbooks. It's picking a theme and building a collection on the theme, whether that's just three pieces or whether it's like ten or twenty pieces. Um, by taking one idea and just kind of treating it like a prism and like turning it around and around to see all the sides of it, um, you you find I, I found anyway that um, I get more ideas by doing that. Uh, by taking, write down your advice. <laughs> yeah, by taking one one theme and you can interpret it loosely or strictly. All those different sketchbooks, you know, to some degree or another, are on one theme. But sometimes I kind of treat it more loosely because then as you work into it, you're getting new ideas. You're going to think, well, this isn't really on the theme, but like it still sort of fits. It's all kind of in the same family of, of, uh, of ideas. And like I found nothing to benefit like me personally and professionally, like producing a collection of work every year on a theme and collecting it into a sketchbook because it's given me new prints, new originals, um, all sorts of new um, ideas throughout the process. Um, and it's it's like a whole yearly portfolio refresh. Um, it, it can it can be that way if, if you're producing enough of the stuff in it. But I mean, yeah. you know, I, um, so even now like on Patreon, what I do is I, um, I take um, just like a, a, like a troll or a creature and I'm just kind of slowly building out like a little side project of this this little tiny world um that's just these like trolls and creatures and that's what some of the more recent stuff that i showed you from earlier that's what that's from yeah and that kind of stuff is you know it's just um keeping keeping things going and keeping me like doing the sort of work that i want to do um and uh you know so and that's just like one piece here one piece there um hopefully then creating a kind of momentum and moving from piece to piece and, you know, celebrate your successes here, but don't dwell on it and move on to the next one. Cause then also don't dwell on failures. Um, Cause you know, I, I know I used to, I mean, years ago, I would just, just, I mean, like to the, to the point of like complete total frustration and tears, not being where I want to be really feeling that like, like, you know, woe to the artist who's, like ideas ruined by poor execution. Um, oh, well, because at the same time, like, you know, surround yourself with people who are way better than you. Yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, most of my professional uh, career, I've, I've worked um, in some capacity, you know, with, with Justin, Justin Gerard, which, you know, you, you know. Um, and like that guy is just on a complete other level. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm always like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn and I'm going to learn from that. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and, you know, do what I can to, um, I, I mean, I get, I, I, I don't box, I don't, I don't do any kind of things like that, but I imagine if you train with somebody who's better than you, that's how you're uh -huh. going to learn. And so, you know, it's like, there's a degree of throwing yourself in the deep end of, well, I just have to figure this out or like, I'm not going to make it. Like, Absolutely. you know, I, I definitely experienced that um, 10, 15 years ago, felt a lot of that kind of frustration where I could see where I wanted my work to be. I was not there mm -hmm. and I had to find a way to like, like level grind in an RPG to get yes. to the point where I felt like I could then go on and, and like take on the boss and like do the thing that I, I was meaning to do because I was just feeling so you know beat down by not being where i wanted to be and what snapped me out of that was doing the sketchbooks i started the first one in 2008 uh, and it was just hodgepodge collection you know not on a theme just whatever and um you know i kind of got a, a lot of satisfaction out of just putting everything together and then having a thing to look at mm -hmm. and like this is this is the best work i had to show for myself this year and then go on to 2009 and 10 and from there on move up to you know today um and what i've found is that it um it helps create um you know where i was feeling uh like i wasn't 
prolific and I wasn't getting the work done that I wanted to do and frustrated with the little bit that I was able to do by giving it a structure and by giving myself a framework to work within, yeah. um, it really like set me on the right path. And it was a, it was a huge boost uh, to then be able to, like, I'm not just doing a piece here, doing a piece there. I'm working towards completing a collection of ideas that I have. And then there's an end goal to that. Get it done, print it, and now you have it. And then set it aside and go on to the next one. So it's it's kind of been this uh, thing that's kind of defined and structured my personal work for uh, years, years and years now. I mean, uh, over 10 years. I mean, yeah, that's great. And I think, do you, do you have anything to say for people that may be right now in that level of frustration and just feeling like they're not able to move forward? Would it be to like create a project that has maybe not a set deadline, but some kind of a goal that you can work towards? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's, that would be, it would be helpful. It'd be a right step um, to, you know, to take three related ideas, take, take one piece with three related ideas and build a, a tiny series. I, I, you know, I feel like there's some kind of magic in that, in in um, work that's connected, whether directly or you know, even just by association. You have a set of things. Um, somehow, it it's worked for me. I don't know that it's something that's going to work for everybody. Um, you know, another part of it is I know for me it was fear. It was fear of mm. not being good enough and fear of everybody else figuring out that I'm not, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's not quite so much that, but like, like they can see all the holes in like, see all the ways you've kind of like shored up your, your work. Yeah. With all the little like shortcuts and like all those kind of things. And it's like, you have to, you have to strip it all away and get down to um, really like, what, are, what is it you want to do? What do you want to say? what do you want to show? How do you want to make people feel or what do you want to like, where do you want to lead them? Yeah. And those aren't really, those are, those are difficult questions. Those are, those are not easy questions to answer. And, you know, if you can, uh, that's, that's how it was for me anyway, that, um, you know, realizing that like, um, this little cat, <laughs> realizing that like, I, I feel like, um, just sort of paralyzed by like, there was a point where like, I couldn't look at certain artists' websites um, in like what? late, late 2000s because I was so, so hung up on um, how my work was not where I wanted it to be. And the way I got over that um, was I started a whole, uh, in 2009, uh, I organized Maurice Sendak, where the wild things are, oh, yeah. um, like fan art website, basically. I, I called it like a tribute and just invited all these artists that I had uh, admired and was a little intimidated by to join the project. And that was like exposure therapy for getting over being stressed out by people being way better than me. It's just getting in there. And so I did a ton of work for myself for the site. Um, yeah. And by the end of it, you know, I think we had um, a couple hundred to 300 uh, different wow. contributing artists for the site. It's still up. It's, it's uh, terribleyelloweyes.com. Is it really? Uh, all the comments are probably full of spam because <laughs> I don't I don't like clean them up anymore because this was like 2009. But terribleyelloweyes.com um, but should still be there, hopefully. I, I ah, it is. will pay the domain for it. Um, so it's something that I organized that was kind of, um, uh, and at the same time, I had just finished my first real series of work in 2009, bunch of fairy tale art. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I feel like that was, you know, while I had been working full time since 2005, yeah. uh, 2006, it took a couple years before I felt like I was in a point where I could sort of show what I was doing on a, on a larger scale. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's kind of where that was at. I think I'm going to submit to this because <laughs> I have like I've, a giant thought, where the wild like, are drawing. Uh, I've thought about like, you know, 
starting it up again. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Well, I feel like, I mean, that story specifically touched so many of us. I feel like it's such an artist style book, you know, yeah. like feeling on the outside, feeling different. You feel like, uh, I don't want to say necessarily a monster, but you definitely feel different. And I think that's yeah. how that story speaks. I think that's great. <laughs> Never heard of this before. And as I'm like scrolling down, I'm like, yeah, these are all really great. <laughs> yeah. And it got to the point where like, you know, people would uh, send in, send in stuff. And so, you know, a lot of the early, mo in fact, most, if you were to, to go all the way down to the bottom, all the early ones were people I uh, invited and then people just kind of started coming along and sending oh. stuff in. And you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't able to post every single thing that I got in, but um, you know, cause then it reached a point where I felt like I was protecting the collection and I couldn't yeah. just open it up to whatever. Um, but you know, I was really, uh, really moved by people's response to it. And it was, uh, it, it was nice. So, okay. Wait, question. Cause as I'm scrolling here, it looks like you had a gallery opening. Oh yeah. Uh, gallery nucleus. Yes. And then um, you had hair. Yeah. I've never seen you with a full swath of hair. <laughs> oh man. Well, again, I, I mean, I had hair like down to here. Oh, uh, like, what? Over 10 years, like 10 years ago. I had super long hair for a, a period of time in my life. I loved my hair, but it, it, it jumped ship, abandoned me. So <laughs> all, all gone now. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I used to have super long hair. Oh, that's great. And I'm glad you leaned into talking about the fear thing too, because I think Obviously, every artist deals with it on some capacity, and it's yeah. kind of good to hear even yourself, who has worked with very high-end clients that people would consider end-game clients, and even you've still had issues with fear in the past, and you've overcome them. Yeah. And it's that weird, well, what's that called? The imposter syndrome, where we will always carry a little bit of that with us, no matter where you're at in your your level. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I like that. Okay, my last of the 10 questions, and then we're gonna get into user questions. So these okay. can be a little more silly, they're a little more fun. Uh, <laughs> but the last serious one, at least for me, is what advice would you give about being authentic in your work? Huh. Which, That's oddly it. enough, I feel like you've done a pretty good job at kind of intermingling that kind of question throughout your answers so far, but yeah. specifically. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, man, I feel like I don't even have a good answer for that. Um, because I feel like like I, all I can do is the sort of work that I can do. Like I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, it's like there's work I can see, work I admire, work that yeah. I like, I wish I could incorporate into what I do, but I just can't, it doesn't fit. It's like something, something doesn't quite click. Um, I, I, I probably make more sense if I had an example. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I have the, I have the kind of work that I'm, I'm drawn to, um, the sort of stuff that just for whatever reason, I just really admire and appreciate Yeah, that kind of all filters through. And then it's just the kind of work that I like to do. Um, and so as far as like, I don't know, being authentic, I mean, it's, it's just kind of, I don't know, sort of inescapable. Like you, the the work you're doing, it's 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 you. And even if you're trying to be somebody else, or you know, uh, approximate somebody else, or like you know, do something like somebody else, it's it's still you as a person doing it. Um, so I mean, it's kind of inescapable. Um, but as far as like doing work that feels like real and that that is something that's deeply personal or like what you want to what you want to say. I mean, I think that's, that maybe that's tougher. Um, and that's something that you have to like, it just takes time. Uh, I mean, I don't feel like, you know, every single thing I've done has been, you know, this meaningful thing. Um, you know, I feel like some of it has meant more to me than others. And some of it, I, <clears throat> excuse me, has, has kind of resonated more with people than, than other things I've done. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's the sort of thing that like, if it's, I don't know if you can hear that. My, my, my children are upstairs and they're, I feel like I'm about to be like BBC dad and just like, they're just going to come like down the stairs. Yeah. Like, I'm, running at you full speed. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, you just you just do the work that you want to see, and it's uh, just be grateful. People respond to it, and I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, I wish I wish I had like a great like and and that could tie this up in a bow, um, but it's it's tricky. I mean, like, well, like what like what what does that mean for you? Like, what does doing authentic work mean for you? Uh, you t to be honest, it's been a real battle for me personally because even I'm doing a card deck right now, and I I've been telling a lot of my art friends it's been really difficult because I know my my all's not in it. I have like seventy percent yeah. pride in them, and then yeah. the other thirty percent just feels like I'm. I'm making a product with the intention to sell and it's it's hard battling that mentally when I feel like I want to be an artist that does authentic work but I feel like I'm creating um, pieces right now that are just specifically meant to help support me financially so yeah. it I, no, I, that's, I'm it's not a bad thing though that's not bad oh I mean this yeah. could be like a whole discussion because to me it's yeah. a really I, I'm one of those people who I get really um, deep into authenticity and I judge people based on how authentic I feel they're being. Unfortunately, it's like one of my flaws. So <laughs> if I, if someone like my sister embellishes everything and it drives me nuts because I'm like, no, that's not the real story. And I hate yeah. that then the person hearing it thinks that that's, you know, and then it carries on. And I think yeah. art is very similar where I think a lot of people chase what's popular and they recreate that in their work. And oftentimes when I'm scrolling on Instagram or if I go to, I do so many conventions where I see a lot of artists that I can tell who their influences are, but yeah. they're not really uh, broadening the original influencer. I feel like they're just kind of taking it and borrowing it as their own to make money. And I feel like in today's art society, that's been a very common thing. And I, I found myself even being in it when I first yeah. started doing conventions of I should draw a fox because fox sells well. And I yeah. did a I did a fox print, and admittedly, I didn't feel great. It sold well, but it was this weird dichotomy of trying to figure out, well, what kind of artist do I want to be? So, yeah. admittedly, for me, it has been a little tougher. And I think it's been kind of magical talking with you because you are so clearly, you know, you're down, you're carving. Not only have you carved your own path, but you are down that path. Like you're at a mountain. You are just doing your own work that is very, very much specifically you. It rings you like if I ever scroll, if I even see like a, a fraction of a second of the drawing, I know it's you, you know, <laughs> and I, I wish more artists, including myself, could find that and feel comfortable knowing that that's what matters. And it's not the following count. It's not the reaction and likes that you get on social media. It's feeling like you carved a path that was all your own and that will stand out and yeah, so for me, it has been kind of a battle because I feel like I am constantly teeter-tottering the whole, am I doing this for profit? Because I have this business mind, I'm very competitive driven, and I really like games. So I always think of my business as like a monopoly or like a, a board game and like you want to win, but right. you realize there is no winning. You, know, you can make more money perhaps, but in the yeah. art world, the real winning is finding that authentic voice and then relishing it's, in that it, it's uh it's it's personal satisfaction and you know if you're looking Absolutely. for that out, outside of yourself you're, you 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 cannot find it yep. you know it's a matter of of competing against yourself and competing against you know with the work you've done previously and trying to find uh trying to find a way to do something better than you did before or you know it's yeah. it's um it's something that uh, it, it takes a lifetime to to figure out. I mean, it's not something that you know. I you know I just figured out right now. You know, <laughs> it's like it takes forever. It takes forever to 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 figure it all out. Well, what's right. funny is it's like there there are choices that you make along the way of your art journey that kind of define the direction. So for me, I remember after I met Alan Williams and realizing, oh, you can do just pencil work as like your yeah. medium. Yeah. And it totally set me on this different course of thinking, right? Before that, I was doing a lot of color. I was doing a lot of fan art because that's what I thought you had to do at conventions. And no, there's no guidebook to doing that. This is like seven years ago. And right. I'm trying to figure out how do I go into it. So then after meeting Alan Williams, I remember being like, you know what? I'm just going to make my whole booth graphite. That's where I find the most 
joy. That's where I find myself the most in. And I thought I was going to hurt financially, but the first con I had all pencil was the best con I did up to that point financially. So then it's funny where then even Pete talks about this too, where if you become the artist you want to be and you're authentic and you're creating works that is not only creative, but has a technical prowess to it, uh, financial gain is just a, a aftermath of it. Like it, it just comes along with it because you're staying true to being authentic, which resonates with so many people and then they'll want to support you. Yeah, pe people, people can pick up on it and that's what they'll gravitate towards. Yes. You know, it's, I, you know, you, you, like you say, walk through conventions, which I hope we do some sometime soon. I don't know when we're ever going to get to conventions again. <sighs> um, that's a whole nother topic, but one that I feel like a lot of people are talking about right now. Um, it is admittedly uh, one of the questions in the user questions, which we'll get to. We'll, we'll get to it. You'll we'll get, get to it. it. Um, but yeah, like you walk conventions and, you know, it's like, you know, like Doctor Who, like zombie mashup. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I try, I can't even think of like some of the horrible things I've seen over the years. <laughs> yeah, doing conventions in 2008, man. Like, it's been oh, a yeah. long time. Um, but like, yeah, I, I see some of that stuff. And like one, I always felt so iffy on like copyright stuff that I yeah. never felt comfortable doing any of that. Um, yeah. And two, it always felt like almost like pandering. Like, ooh, if I'm uh, like this, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is what's popular right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like do something and then hope that it's still popular in like two months, you know, by the mm -hmm. time I actually go to a convention or something. And so, you know, like at least for me, I just, well, I mean, I, I love fairy tales, I love fantasy, I love all that kind of stuff. And you just kind of put it all together. That's the kind of work. I'm going to do. And like, it's, it's been gratifying during conventions, almost every single show I've ever done. I've had somebody, um, at least once during the, the show come up and like, look at everything and lean in and say, this is fresh air. What you're doing here is fresh air for me. And that's gratifying. Um, I saw a guy once I saw him see me across. It was a New York comic con, which is just, as you know, massive. Yeah. Um, I saw a guy notice me like I was just standing I was against the wall like you know one of the the one year and I'm just like standing kind of like looking and I see this guy like stop and he just he's got like bags and like stuff and he just hustles over and he's like what is this what is this like I, like he like <laughs> couldn't like he couldn't process it apart from like you know like Green Lantern and like you know, yeah. whatever other like sort of superhero kind of like comic book stuff. Um, it, it's, it stands out in a way. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, it, you're going to resonate with the people that, that you resonate with. And, um, well, I'm great for the people that, that show up and, and like what I do. And I mean, there's so much that could be said about this because I, I, I do so many shows where I befriended. I'm, a, I'm definitely a talker at shows, so I go like to go to everyone's booth and talk. I, uh, I appreciate it. I <laughs> always appreciate it. Well, and it's funny because I have so many friends that they do do fan art, but it's funny how much of a similar note of um, struggle that they feel and what you were saying with the pandering thing. When, yeah. when your whole booth identity is fan art, they say that the biggest struggle for them is every two years, they basically have to restock or not restock. They have to redo all their work because what was popular two years ago is no longer trending. Yeah. And it's this this vicious cycle of having to recreate or not, not recreate make new art of whatever's right. popular and current now and what's right. trending. And they, they say it gets to them. And I, I always try to tell people that come in my streams or whenever I see them at conventions that uh, there's this weird presumption that original art, doesn't do well at shows. But in my experience and all the people that I've ever talked to, the ones that make the most money are always original artists. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a little bit of a bell curve for sure. I think mm -hmm. when you're starting off, if you only do original, it the money might not be a good return. But the thing that I got, especially when I went all original like six years ago, uh, kind of like what you mentioned, the feeling that you get of someone buying an original work versus someone buying a fan art piece, like what if I did a League of Legends piece versus an original, someone buying an original felt 10 times better than it did selling a yeah. fan art piece. And then that 
that's another one of those moments where you realize what type of artist do you want to be? Because some artists, they're totally okay making fan art. And to them, it's a job. It's not like this craft of, you know, who we are as individuals being asserted into our work. And that's okay. But I think for other artists, and I think you for sure are like encapsulate that, it would be impossible to just pander to other people and cater to what they want when for you creating art is so personal and so deeply entwined with who you are. That... Yeah. And also, I don't feel, I couldn't anticipate what people would want. I mean, I, didn't <laughs> talk about that earlier. Like, I, I wouldn't know. You mean you're not like, watching the latest anime? <laughs> I would just waste my time trying to figure out like, what do people want? Like goodness knows. Cause I don't uh, like, well, so, okay. So like, you know, case in point, I like to bring um, like the labyrinth tales and the dark crystal tales are two books that I wrote um that are for labyrinth and dark crystal um you know as many of those as i bring to a convention because i I can get them from the publisher and then you know i i get them like at cost or whatever um and then i can sell them um i bring them almost more for um well i'm proud of them um but i bring them because i like they make a nice little like they look great like i'm really Mm -hmm. pleased with the way they look um but i know that however many I bring, however many I sell, it's people's affection for those properties that it's that are selling the books. Um, and so in some in some cases, I use them a little bit like um, it's just to get people to slow down and go, oh, that's that thing I like. Like I feel like that works. Oh, yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, like as you say, it's really gratifying when people want to buy sketchbooks or like the hardcover book or like that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm proud of all of them. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of those those two, um, the Labyrinth and Dark Crystal books. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know it's it's because of how people feel for those movies. That's what's at least initially attracting people. Um, and yeah. I don't think that's bad. Like that that's that doesn't bother me because um, I'm, I'm proud of them. I like showing them off. Um, but it's also not going to be like the main focus of my booth, you know, cause people will then ask like, Oh, do you have prints of like whatever, like from the movies and yeah. like, you know, no, I, I don't, I don't make prints of, of any of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, the book feels complete also because I wrote it. And so it feels like this complete thing that I can offer people rather than just because it's like I, I don't bring the novels or like any of the other stuff that I've done because I didn't write those as well yeah uh, you know so this feels like a, a, a total package thing so I forgot that that's probably new for you because when I first met you a while ago at a con it was all original but then I guess yeah now that you've done these you know labyrinth and dark crystal books now you have yeah. those on your booth and I think what people need to realize, though, is obviously you have the copyright to sell those, and you ha- you are able to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had I had one one person uh, ask me like, do you, do you have a copyright for this? Like for, like before a convention, and I'm like, well, it's not really about me having the copyright. It's that the like the the publisher has like an Henson company. Yeah, yeah. like. They're, they're real books, like they're official books. <laughs> these aren't uh, fake books. But, these are real I, books. I, I didn't print these up and like staple them together. <laughs> like this, like they're real books. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. I did a, they once come up and they're like, you did Labyrinth? Like that was my favorite movie when oh. I was a kid. And like, <laughs> You're like, I did. Do I Thank look? You. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what year that movie came out? Like, like late shoot. 80s? Yeah, like I, it was like 86, Labyrinth came out. Oh, I was mid-80s? three. Okay. I was three years old when that movie came out. Dark Crystal, I wasn't even born yet. All right? So, come on. I Honestly, though, if I were you, I'd just own it. Be like, oh, you're welcome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had it before where like, like, well, like, so a while ago you were saying you had a print that was like had a fox in it or something. Yeah. And I had a fox that was in the menagerie collection and it was, it always was a really popular little print. And for a while there, I would have people saying like, Oh, is this the, like that fantastic Mr. Fox movie? Is this <laughs> at conventions. And I would always like, I'd be like, no, no, swearers from this sketch. I was just kind of like, I was so tired of it. And the one time I was like, next person who says it, I'm just going to say that I don't know what they're talking about. I've never oh, heard no. of it. And so, like, somebody came up and they're like, is this fantastic, Mr. Fox? And I, it just, like, they just caught me. 
Like, I feel like I'm usually very good at talking with people because I really like talking about my work. I like talking about art. It's why we're all here. Yeah. Uh, that time just kind of caught me. And I was like, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of it. Like, really? You would love it. You would work. And I realized at that point, I don't have the energy to <laughs> keep up with this. I have, I have, I have like put my foot in it now because I cannot carry this conversation. I can't, I can't. And I was just kind of, yeah. Like, ah, just, just done. Done Wait, that over it. I, I feel like I could have so many funny questions to ask you about con convention people specifically <laughs> where you're just stuck with them. But if I was in your situation with that scenario, I would have totally just played up. Oh, I'm actually, yeah, I'm Wes Anderson's half brother. I kind of mentioned the idea and I did a lot of the concept work. I would just ham it up. <laughs> I would keep hamming it until the point where it was very obvious that it can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, but we're at the point now where we get all the user questions. So I've collected quite a few. Okay, great. And we'll try it. There's a lot. So we'll, we'll try to get through them. Totally good. Totally okay. Good. Um, the first one is from Athena. says, what's your favorite character from the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance? Oh, it's got to be D. I totally agree. <laughs> D. And, um, and Becky Henderson, the, the puppeteer who performs D. Um, uh, if you follow her on Instagram, she does she does drawings. Uh, she does a lot of really? work. Um, she's great. Wait, what's and, her Instagram? Um, I think it's Youngster Becky, like youngster, like like a Pokemon trainer, like youngster, <laughs> uh, youngster B E C C Y. But yeah, she she performed Deet. She, she performed a handful of other characters too. Oh yeah. Uh, the, prequel, the prequel novels follow a character named Naya, and Becky also performed Naya in the show. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm especially like, like just love Naya and Deet. Um, and so, um, so yeah. I mean, personally, I went into Dark Crystal, the, the Netflix series, and I was curious on if it was going to kind of have the same tone as the original movie. But to be honest, I actually like the series better. And I honestly would say it's kind of how Game of Thrones should have ended its whole arc where it kind of, it's, it's dramatic. I was surprised yeah. at how much, I, I don't want to say adult tones, but there were a lot of very serious like repercussions and deaths and mm -hmm. things that happened where I'm like, this is fantastic. To me, that is fantasy. You know, yeah. it's like kind of grim, grim-like, um, yeah. but that, it was great. So I was really surprised with how much I liked it. And then I don't, did you see the documentary on Netflix? So I watched the series through twice. And I have not watched the documentary <gasps> because I wanted to watch it again before I watched the documentary. And I just never got around to it. And then, so it's just this thing that like I've seen clips of, but I haven't sat down to watch the whole thing yet. Yeah. I, know, I know like I have a piece or two that shows up in it. Um, yeah. And I show the credits of the show, but otherwise I'm like, um, I, I like, it's a show that I can't just play. And like, while I'm working, I have to sit yeah. and, and, totally completely watch it and so because of that it's something that is difficult for me to get around to do to like make yes. the time to sit and like i'm gonna do nothing else and just sit and absorb this um so yeah it's very difficult yeah yeah well especially for you now that you are father of three. Oh yeah i don't know if you can hear him one was just crying upstairs <laughs> uh, the microphone's picking it up but <laughs> oh no, you're good <laughs> yeah they're 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 okay. Nobody <laughs> nap today. Nobody nap. That's what it is. If nobody naps, then uh, they're just miserable till bedtime. Oh gosh, it's not that bad. Actually. I give a lot of credit to people that have kids and also do an art life because I feel like art's also a child that you have to like cater to and tend to in a way. <laughs> yeah, you gotta take care of it. Uh huh. Yeah. All right, this one's from. Let's see here. Where was it? C Smith Art says, "Do you prefer digital or traditional?" Uh, everything I do begins traditionally, whether or not it progresses to digital, uh, usually depends on the project or the client's needs or what I want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but everything begins, um, as a drawing or watercolor. Um, and so if I end up scanning it, um, you know, then I might do some digital work, but, um, yeah, there's kind of a. Whatever, whatever the the project actually needs. Do you like one better than the other? Um, I don't like drawing digitally. 
Um, mm. But I, so that's why everything I do is traditional drawing at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like painting, uh, like traditional painting, but I I can't do that for client stuff uh, because so often, even if like, you know, everything's done, approved, like ready to go, mm -hmm. there's still going to be changes, like that no is. matter what. Like there's always going to be something. Um, and so like to save myself the headache and heartache down the line, mm -hmm. most of my client stuff, in fact, probably you could say all of it um, ends up digital. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of the nature of that sort of stuff. And so as far as personal stuff goes, I do some paintings, um, but most of it is just drawing or, you know, if I end up doing a little digital stuff, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Preferring one over another? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I draw the most, so that, I guess that's it. Yeah. No, I feel that too. Um, this one's from your biggest fan ever, Sean Price. It says, uh, actually, I was dogging him because he said tips for how to use color effectively, but he didn't use a question mark. He used an exclamation point. So I don't know if he's just proclaiming, <laughs> <laughs> but I assume he wants to ask you the question. <laughs> Um, well, years ago, um, I remember picking up on some little simple color theory thing from one of those, uh, Disney concept art books, yeah. um, this sort of like this, like three, like two analogous colors and one tertiary color and one of the analogous colors being a little desaturated. Um, and I've kind of employed that little triangle through almost everything I've done. Mm. Uh, Either that or I love just sort of a warm, sort of um, golden green, <laughs> like kind of you, look. You don't things. say. You don't. Okay. <laughs> Surprisingly. I don't see it. Yeah, I don't see that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's there. It's there somewhere. Um, and so, you know, I do a lot of that kind of stuff. And I mean, like, I don't feel like a piece is, at least if I'm doing something digitally, I don't feel like it's quite done until when I'm finished. Uh, and then kind of put a layer of color if I'm in Photoshop layer of color on top it's kind mm -hmm. of a warm orange sort of like um, I don't know maybe uh, something kind of like that and then take the opacity down to like 10% or 20% or something like that kind of it's something about that it's like doing a wash right at the end of everything and just so kind of like get it more of a warm, warm aura yeah, yeah. And yeah. there, there's something about that, that that is what feels like, and now I've finished it. It's it's that kind of final like glazing or render um, that kind of goes right in at the very end. And so, yeah, like I never really plan my palettes too much when I get into doing color work, oh. just kind of start. And, you know, even if it's a client thing, sometimes I get direction, but sometimes I don't. Um, and I just kind of get into it and find it as I go. Yeah. Uh, which I know is not, not the most helpful answer, um, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, just kind of like find yourself in the, in the thick of it as you move along. But I mean, that's uh, honest though. If that's how you work with color, that's how you yeah, work. It tends to be what I do. And, you know, sometimes it like, you know, it might be more useful to plan stuff ahead of time. Um, I might, I might save myself some trouble if I do that, but. I yeah. usually don't. I usually just kind of get into it. And also, too, I like um, the drawing to do the heavy lifting for the piece anyway, whether or not I'm painting it or like whatever else is going on. I, I want the drawing to carry it. And so, you know, a strong drawing can carry kind of a, a less involved painting. Um, but like mm -hmm. the other way around doesn't work. Like mm -hmm. no amount of paint can hide a bad drawing. And so, you know, um, it's it's one of those like, um, you know, I, I put more focus on the, the actual drawing yep. uh, before it comes to the painting. So like make your value strong, make your composition strong. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's the main focus for me. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So then this one kind of going back to what we were talking about before from Sayonoli, I think is how you say it. How is COVID-19 affecting your business? Uh, fortunately I've had, um, no projects fall through or be delayed. Um, I have, you know, stuff 
uh, new projects coming in even as of this week. And so, you know, as far as uh, as far as that side of things goes, um, I have not experienced any any change or downturn in anything, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. Um, I also work from home. Uh, my studio, uh, if you can see, is just the downstairs <laughs> of our house. Um, and so this is just uh, as far as like working arrangements, nothing has really changed apart from uh, we're just not going anywhere uh, and staying in. Yeah. Um, that that side being said, um, the convention side, uh, I'm I'm going to miss this year. I, I don't know what uh, I, like talk of shows coming up in the summer and fall and like that kind of stuff. Like I can't imagine, I can't imagine things. I can't imagine being comfortable going to a show. I mean, not right now, of course, but like yeah, two months, three months, like I just don't believe that it's going to be, and I could be wrong. I hope, I hope to be wrong, but like, it just doesn't look like it's going to be any different. I don't um, think we'll see a con this year. Even I think Dragon Con just recently basically said they won't. It won't be happening this year. When when did they say that? Was it? Well, Georgia officially made it declared. So we're waiting now for Dragon Con to announce it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like I, I was trying. I was trying to just trying to dance around like like naming anything. Uh, but yeah, Dragon Con. Oh on yeah. Because I love that show. Um, oh, I love top the three for such sure. A fun show. What's that? Yeah. I would say top three for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's like Dragon Con, New York Comic Con are my two of my, my most favorites. And like New York, October, you know, that I don't think they've talked about it yet. Like, no, because it's October. But, um, you know, they did applications like normal uh, back a month or so ago. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then Dragon Con. Um, I, 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 I just can't see doing it. Like I can't like no. of all, of all places to be like in a, you know, 70,000 to a hundred thousand, whatever the attendance is, um, you know, all in this tight space. And like, and like at a convention too, you're, you're just constantly projecting because it's like, it's loud. Yeah. You're talking over a crowd and you've, you've seen all these, like, you know, um, like how, how much you're actually like, you know, expire, not expiring. What's the word? Like, we're like expelling, expelling. Yeah. you know, because you're raising your voice and like, <laughs> like, you know, my grandmother, uh, uh, got it and she nearly oh. died. Uh, she has recovered and she had, oh, um, a mild case and it was, it was just like debilitating. Um, and so like, I've seen firsthand, um, you know how bad some of this is and she and she had friends that died um and so like it's nothing to play with and i i yeah so all that to say in 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 terms of my work for um client projects nothing is uh fortunately nothing has shifted as of yet uh but yeah travel and conventions i don't see doing any of it this year no uh, you know 2021 like i i hope i hope to be kind of like back on it uh but as far as this year goes like it's it's the smart thing to do to just stay put i i, right. I can't be going out i know i keep telling all my my convention friends just, i wouldn't even plan on anything this year like even new york and even we have a few that are in the fall like november area and I just keep telling them, I just don't see it happening, honestly. I would just plan for 2021 and put your focus into online efforts, whether that's Patreon or YouTube, whatever you can do to make yeah. it until then, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, I, you know, my, my, I, I, I feel for people who um, their, their primary source of yeah. income is conventions because it's, it's just a, it's, a, it's an awful year for that. Um, it's like, you know, I was talking to Justin like way back. It feels like way back. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> like two months. <laughs> you know, yeah, seriously. I mean, like it was March. And, you know, he's just like, the thing is like, you're in a place. It's like, if, if you just avoid crowds and avoid close contact with people and avoid like tight spaces, 
you'll you sh you, you'll be all right and it's like all that is is a convention it's like yeah. close quarters <laughs> tight spaces of, and, and like constant human interaction yeah you're constantly dealing with uh with like exchanging things and like taking cards or like all, all this kind of stuff and like no amount of mask is gonna like stop me from like touching my face like nothing short of like a i've told a, a few like i was talking to ashley love it um the other day oh yeah like like a, like nothing short of a stormtrooper helmet is gonna stop me <laughs> from like like just messing with my my face yeah. and like so yeah i mean maybe we all wear stormtrooper helmets and <laughs> for convention, like it'll it'll all work but like yeah anyway we, we can move on i i feel like we, i could i could drag this on and talk about this for forever so well and i think it's because such it's such a pressing issue for artists nowadays because <laughs> i'm i'm sure you're very similar where a good chunk percentage of my art friends rely on conventions as their main source of income so I remember in March, I don't know how it was for you and I don't know how you communicated with, you know, your your crew, but uh, there was like a, a weekend of panic and I was definitely involved in it too because I had a huge house project that I had to pay by June. And I was like, right. I don't know how I'm going to pay for roofing and siding if I don't have conventions. Yeah. And there was a good weekend where all of us kind of panicked. But what I've been seeing, though, is um, just by being together and then talking out loud about your concerns and then figuring out, OK, I was able to get my panic out. Let me put down kind of a list of how I can move past this, what I can do. And for me, it was making a card deck. And I think for other people, it's pushing their Patreon. And then other people, it's like really pushing education content on YouTube. So I think the advice I would give to people who maybe that was their main source of income is to find other outlets temporarily. And the beauty of it is once conventions do eventually get back up and running, you'll have this other source of income that will hopefully be like a revenue stream that will just be consistent on the yeah. side, you know? And I think that's never put all of your, what's that? All of your things in one oh, basket. All your eggs in one basket. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I think this was a really tough lesson for a lot of us to learn and like one that we were forced to learn, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's, man yeah it's 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 tough um yeah i i um i'm trying to yeah we, we can we can wrap it up yeah I, I, I can, we could just we could just keep talking about that because it's so ever present it like, really is and yeah. unfortunately we don't have a conclusion yet like we don't have any good oh you know cons will start up in february 2021 you can start yeah. ramping up for that. like we don't know it's kind of uh, it, this sort of infinite present is how I've, I've heard somebody describe it. Yep. There, you know, the past feels like, <laughs> like, you know, well, this was just before and, you know, <laughs> future. Well, like, well, it's very, feels difficult to plan. Yeah. Um, yes. And we're just kind of caught in this infinite present uh, getting, getting through. I like that so. infinite present. Yep. That's what it is, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Skoho K says, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Nope. Never had what? any friends come into it. Um, I I'm surprised. probably would have if I had had friends that were into it, but nobody played. Um, and um, no. well, I, what was like I, a I appreciate school, the idea. Like what was your high school quarry game or like what, what, what really gravitated uh, you? Zelda. Oh, <laughs> I should have guessed that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I like. I wish I knew how many hours <laughs> I have cumulatively put into Ocarina of Time on the N sixty four. I I know every polygon of that game. Is um, that your favorite yeah, game? That and then you know, Link to the Past, and um, I, I love Zelda games. I've, I so yeah, high school Corey would have been playing Zelda or drawing or um, I where I where I grew up. It was a little town called Traveler's Rest. And it's, it's right at the foothills of the Appalachians. And so it's like from my hometown, it's just, you can see all the Blue Ridge going yeah. north, but it's like, it's the last stop before you get into, like now you're driving through mountains. And so it's Traveler's Rest. Is that, uh, is that how you pronounce the mountains? Appalachian. Oh my gosh. I don't know if it's my Wisconsin. Appalachian, people say Appalachian. I mean, it's like, 
My grandmother's always said Appalachian, so that's just that's probably that probably is the correct way of saying it. But now I feel dumb. My whole life I've been saying Appalachian. I mean, I, people say it either way: Appalachian Trail, Appalachian Trail. I mean, whatever. Well, then I, follow up to you. Then what is your favorite Zelda game? Is it Ocarina? It's it's probably Breath of the Wild. Wow! Wow! Yeah. I adore that game. I mean, it is pretty um, solid. It, but it came out, and I didn't play it for like eight months because I knew I wouldn't be able to do anything else with my life. And I had to get myself to a point where I had enough things that were done that I could kind of block out a week and play it like it was my job. <laughs> um, so for I've done that with every major Zelda release like ever since. Or, well, never since. But leading up to that, I mean, to say uh, because like what I would do is uh, I played like you know, Twilight Princess. I played it in like 30 minute chunks over the course of like six months. I was just so busy, but I was so wanting to play it. I, I yeah. was like struggling to like find any time to do it. Uh, and I just had the most fractured experience and I can, I can't remember the game. And I'm just like, it was a, it was a good one, but like, I don't remember it at all. Yep. And what I've done ever since is like sit and like wait until I can block out about a week and just play it like it's my job. And then, you know, Breath of the Wild, though, I just keep playing it and just just keep just run, just wandering around. Like, I love um, being outside. I love hiking. I love that kind of stuff. And Breath of the Wild really does scratch that itch of just wandering for me. Um, so I, I, I love that a lot. I love the story of Ocarina. Um, I love the feeling from that game. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's, it's, it's the two of them, Ocarina and Breath of the Wild. I mean, I love Wind Waker. I, I love them all. I love them all for different reasons, but I like, Wind Waker. um, yeah, as far as one that like, you know, I've, I've put 400 at some hours into Breath of the Wild, you know, over the last <laughs> like, three years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I don't think I could ever say I put that many hours. In. Oh, nah, never mind. <laughs> I'm like, oh, does League of Legends count? I'm like, that's such a gross game. <laughs> yeah, it's like I've I've played it through, however many times, like several times, played it all the way through, and like, you know, there was the remake that came out on 3DS. Like, I've, I've played that all the way through. Like, I don't like cumulatively. I don't know how many hours I've put into to that game. So it's possible that's more than uh, Breath of the Wild, but Breath of the Wild's the only one that I have. The, like the little time you know yeah. keeps track of it so i mean have you collected all like the secret easter eggs and things in that game like no no i i kind of did enough to build up my weapons inventory i hope yeah. this is interesting for people <laughs> 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 I, I did enough to kind of build up my inventory and i just i could just play that game over and over and over i love the ending of the game uh, i have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and all they want to do is go to the castle and fight Ganon at the end of Breath of the Wild. <laughs> I, they like how weird and kind of intense it is. It's what they want to do all the time. And like, I love the ending to the game. I like Zelda at the end of the game. It's just so. Uh, I don't know weird. what happens. Uh, spoiler: I won't talk about it. Though. Okay. <laughs> um, but I they they love it, and um, I'm always happy to like. What do you? Uh, we'll kind of like we'll sit down after supper. It's like you know. I'll, I'll keep them for a while before bedtime. And um, you know, it's like, what do you want to do? And like, oh, let's go to the castle and fight Ganon. <laughs> we'll it's like every day, just yeah. fighting Ganon. <laughs> Often enough, I have to stop them sometimes. I'm like, we're not going to do that tonight. So what do you want to do? <laughs> let's go fight some guys. Okay. Yeah. We'll find guys to fight. Okay. So I guess we'll we'll put that one aside then. Yeah, that's, so that's for the next Huge the next Legend episode. of Zelda fan, clearly. <laughs> so then this next question comes from Hobo Sheep says, how do you come up with stories? And in, do you have any advice on improving storytelling? Mm, that's, that's a good one. It's a loaded um, one for sure. You know, I, I feel like I have a, a good structure for building art and for drawing and for coming up with ideas there. Yeah. Um, if that stuff bleeds over into creating stories, that's like a, a, bonus for me um as far as stories go you know i find that if i'm scribbling out ideas and kind of writing that's where i find ideas um but it's a it's a lot more difficult for me um 
you know, drawing is very natural. Uh, drawing makes a lot of sense to me, but actually building up stories I find is much more challenging. And so, you know, I don't feel like I have a good, good enough, like way to explain even how I do it. Um, you know, so like case in point, like the labyrinth stories, uh, for labyrinth tales, mm -hmm. each one of those is just sort of like, what's a regular Tuesday in labyrinth? Like, like what's, what's a day in Sir Didymus? What's his life? Like, you know, let's say Ludo, Ludo's having a bad day. What, what's, what's a bad day for Ludo? Um, it's like that kind of a stuff. So you start with, you know, a little question like that. And the, like the benefit of writing that kind of stuff is those characters are so defined that it's really easy to write for them as long as you come up with a scenario that works. So, yeah. you know, for that kind of stuff, like you, you come up with the idea and you can pretty easily tell how would Sir Didymus react to this or like what would Hoggle do with, you know, this happening to him. Like that kind of stuff is easy to to kind of write for it's it's coming up with the the little scenarios is uh what i find to be the most challenging part of that um so for me um i find that when i when i do write um it's just scribbles and notes and like doodles and like it's a, it's a big mess and then i have to like reformulate all of it <laughs> before i put it in a format for people to actually like process yeah digest well <laughs> while yeah. notes are just a complete mess and i've got like you know circle this arrow to over here i mean for this to move here mm -hmm. like i've got you know this the, the, this image kind of strikes me so i'm going to doodle it real quick so i remember to put it here in the story and like that kind of stuff and so yeah well okay yeah. I'm curious because do you do the thing where some uh, story writers will do well, they'll have like a cork board or something and they'll literally post the main plot areas that they know for sure have to happen and then kind of fill in the blanks as they go? Um, no. no. <laughs> That's not that part of it. It sounds really smart. And I bet it would work for me. And I just, I just kind of get into it and just kind of write my way through it and then go back and like assess it. So Anytime I've done like comics or any kind of like sequential storytelling, I do that too. I build out, this is my ideal. And then I go back and like, like sharpen it and try and like whittle away to get to. So I like mm -hmm. put everything down that I, I would like to see and then find what is actually going to make it work better. Like what's yeah. going to be best from all of this. Um, it's easier to pull back on something than to realize that you don't have enough and you have to, push more on it. Um, so I find that like I put down a lot more than I'll need uh, and then yeah. kind of like come back from that. I think that's smart because then you have at least more to, it, it's better to have more that you have to kind of trim the fat rather than having not enough and then right. there's not you know thin, enough substance like, there. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. This one comes from digitum underscore art says, what makes art look magical? <laughs> Fairy lights. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! What makes it look magical? I guess it depends on your definition of magical. Um, uh, and, like the and, movie and, Legend. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> the, when I think magical, I think the movie Legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love unicorns. Like unironically, unabashedly, uh, I have several <laughs> unicorn pieces here. One from Heather Hitchman. Up there's Annie Stig. Do you can't. really? Yeah, I have an Annie right there. Uh, and then on my mantle, the, the main, let's see. Yeah, the main one on my mantle, right? Oh, yeah. There, right there. Is that right Annie? Is, a, is an Annie Stig. Oh. It's the little unicorn foal. Gorgeous little painting. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the tone, the feeling. Um, you can't, I guess I can't answer it like that. What makes it feel magical? <laughs> it just has a magical quality to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, gosh. I, I mean, know. I just love that you admit that you love unicorns. I mean, you're a full-grown man with a beard. You're it's like, true. I love unicorns. I've got, I've got my cat in my lap like I'm a supervillain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's something that feels transportive. I feel like maybe that's the actual answer for me. Something that mm. feels, 
I don't know. I feel like all the best like fairy tale stuff has a really kind of unsettling sort of approaching an otherworldliness to it. Um, yeah. sort of the idea of a thin place where the, 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 the realm of fairy is not that we feel like there's a place that's like weird things might start happening here. And I feel like there's, there's a degree of that, um, sort of unsettled, um i don't know it's, it's tricky i mean that's in probably going to be different for everybody uh how you personally what makes something feel magical to you um for me i feel like it's something that's just kind of um a little otherworldly but sort of terrestrial like very earthy uh but kind of has a um, you know, kind of a extra natural quality, like not supernatural, but like very of the earth. I don't know. It's, it's tricky. It's, it's a tricky thing to talk. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, the tricky one to like articulate. I think you did um, a good job. I think the being teleporter, what was the word? Not teleporter. Yeah, transportive. Transportive. Yeah. I think it's yeah. a good way to describe it for sure. Yeah, and I well, there's there's this great Tolkien quote that he has in the on fairy stories, this little essay he wrote, and it's it's this gorgeous little thing. I don't have it memorized, so I can't like <laughs> word for word. <laughs> yeah, uh, but like it's 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 the gist of some of that, and it's you know this idea of like um, I don't know. I mean, you could kind of unspool that for forever, I guess. But like, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I like the idea of of the of a, the sort of fairy world being very of the earth, like it's very terrestrial, like it's not supernatural. If anything, you know, a, a human being with a soul is is supernatural uh, versus something that's like totally just born of the the earth. Um, like I, I, that kind of stuff, I, I really like, and it kind of feels otherworldly and weird, and it's kind of got like a I don't know, sort of a unsettling feeling to it. And I think that yeah. is what feels more magical when it feels a little strange, not sort of like pretty in a way. I don't know. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's a good question. I, I'm, I'm probably going to keep thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Even after. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, this next one's from Anthony Delaporta. It says, Corey, I've been told that the best way to get better at art is to constantly draw or paint from reality. Was that the case with you? Uh, no, I wish um, <laughs> I that I, I had been better at, like, study. Um, I think that's, like, a failing in my, uh, in, in my personal education is that I've, I never pushed myself really to do that and was much more concerned with um just sort of doing the sort of stuff that i wanted to do mm -hmm. uh and i feel like I, it would have been i would have benefited from having more like structural education I don't, i'm not sure how to quite put that like academic yeah yeah i think that would i mean it, it, it would only be helpful it wouldn't be a detriment um but you know i i feel like there's there's a degree of like, yes, take in all that learning and then use that for something. Like it's not, I feel like it's not really, it, it doesn't excite me to, to just have like technical ability. I want to, to then yes. do make it say something or like have, you know, like creatures or like, you know, something, do something with it beyond just like I have this, this, you know, draftsmanship prowess like i you know i admire draftsmanship but i also admire imagination and uh, a storytelling aspect narrative aspect of stuff and so that's kind of the three things that i i work with uh that i try and like braid together and so you know i i think that's right i think it's good to do that um at the same time I feel like a a, a way of exercising your mind uh beyond just technical ability is to plan out um a series plan out a, a collection of work um and like like yes use reference like build your work from that kind of stuff um but like i feel like i can tell the pieces where i leaned on reference too heavily 
they stand out to me versus ones where I didn't use any at all. That really stands out to me. It's a very like, uh, it feels like a little bit of a tightrope of walking of like not using the reference too strongly, not borrowing or leaning on it too much, but then also it's, you know, you, you can't just make up stuff that's as interesting as real life. And so trying to, to navigate all that is tricky and it's going to be different for everybody. And it's just a matter of finding that good balance of what's going to, what's going to work in, in the, your particular situation. Yeah. And actually, I don't know how you feel about this, but I was talking um, to another pencil artist, Miles Johnston, and he was talking about how he grew up so academic that sometimes it's hard for him to break out of seeing values and forms in that very academic way of drawing. And he, um, I think about that a lot about uh, artists that kind of teach themselves versus artists that are trained formally and how usually the artists that are trained formally, they all have a very similar look to their value handling where people that usually just kind of teach themselves kind of have their own way of creating form, whether it's with color or saturation, whatever it might be. And I think sometimes, well, it's like the grass is always greener scenario. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I, I totally see with your work how original it feels. And it doesn't surprise me that you didn't have like this formal academic background because your yeah. stuff feels so original and it feels um, not so trained, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I like I like shapes and I like lines. Yeah, <laughs> I like shape and I like lines. <laughs> I, I like them. I like them. I like putting them together. Yeah, that's great. Okay, I only have a couple more for you because I know we're already at that two hour mark, and I try not to take too much of people's time with these. So thank you for indulging me for this a little. No, no, I, I, this is what I planned for the afternoon. Oh, good, good, good. All right, this one's from Jim Hummel. It says, I really love Corey's approach to hair and fur. What influenced your approach and what is your process in regards to hair and fur in particular? Any technical insights? Um, I had a, a teacher once kind of say something that enlightened me when I was, I was in like seventh grade. It was like an after school art thing. And she was talking about, you know, when you're drawing hair to, you know, I mean, it's, this seems so like elementary because it sort of was elementary as seventh grade. I mean, it's like close yeah. enough elementary, but like you're not drawing every individual hair. Yes. See it as in, as in like clumps of hair, as in like sections. Um, and so that just helps with the form and that kind of helps you define it. Um, and so I know I've definitely been like guilty of just shortcutting. Like, I don't know how to draw such and such. I'm just going to kind of hover. <laughs> And like that'll kind of mask any any shortcomings in my like abilities. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, to think of like to think of the structure underneath. I guess it's like anything. It's like drawing clothes or drawing whatever. Like you need to know what's yeah. what's going on underneath so you can have it work uh, realistically. Um, so some of it's reference. Some of it's um, I just have I have a handful of friends who just have amazing hair and. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not too weird about me taking pictures of their hair. Uh, so I have some people like that. Um, some of it's just, um, I love, uh, I love drawing hair. I love, and some of that I think is that kind of John Bauer, um, like all his princesses have just impossibly long hair. Just so beautiful. And like, I, I, I love to draw it. And as far as like creatures and stuff goes, like, you know, you look up like pictures of bears or, you know, whatever, you know, like big animals with a lot of hair and you can still understand the form that's underneath it. Yeah. Uh, it's not like it's this just, I don't know, like just a formless shape, you know, you can. So, I mean, I try and like focus on the, uh, like I have, I have a cover I'm doing right now that's got a bear and a mermaid. It's kind of like right up my alley. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've got like, uh, for, for just this morning doing the sketches on the bear. And the thing is, you know, before I even plan any kind of hair or like what's going on, I want to build out the structure of the, the, the creature itself and try to understand, you know, even simply just how's the joints working, like where's, you know, wrists and like that kind of stuff before I do any kind of like rendering. And mm -hmm. so like, that's a big part of it is just making sure I know like where I'm headed. Uh, before I start kind of going in and like you know, rendering hair. 
Um, yes. Thinking of it in chunks, I think helps. It kind of helps you keep it from being just this wash of hair. You've got like, you know, kind of fur and that's kind of like, I don't know. Well, there's it's, a flow to it. It's not to like get into like also like, you know, it's one thing for me to like speculate about how do I do this? I don't know. Once I get into it, I can see how I'm doing it. But like, <laughs> you can always describe like, you know, how do I do whatever? I don't know. No, no, I mean, that was perfect. I, hair should be shaped. It shouldn't be, unless if you're doing like a macro zoom in on hair, there, yeah. you know, there's no reason to be doing, drawing every single individual hair. Right. Okay, this one comes from Drea. It says, Corey, yeah. I love how vintage and fairy tale your work is, and I was wondering your process slash inspiration into getting into that sort of style. Uh, yeah, it's just natural. It's just it's come really naturally. Uh, it's the sort of stuff I like and admire. Everything from like you know Brian Froud to um, you know, your, your your John Bauer, your Arthur Rackham, Rackham. Like all everybody back in that kind of um, you know fantasy fairy tale lineage. Um, I'm just kind of walking walking down the trail like following along like the signposts of, of where these these legends have gone before uh just kind of walking down a path on that trail and so um you know it's just and you got people like you know tony dieterlisi and like um you know, sort of contemporaries of this um you know that that these are the people that i admire that i follow that i i look to for inspiration um and um yeah it's just i, I had somebody at a convention once they came up and I didn't know what their like dynamic was between the two the two people. It's like um, um, I I didn't know what I didn't know what their situation was, but but the the woman was like very excited, and she was like I'd never bought a print before at our convention. This is my first print, and the guy she was with was an older guy, and he was like I'm glad she's excited because I look at that and all I see is Rackham, Bauer, Charles Bess. Yeah, he listed off all the influences that I wear on my sleeve listed them off. And it's like, I can't be upset by that. Like it doesn't, no. it doesn't bother me because yeah, obviously <laughs> like, like Charles Bess is, is, is one of my, my like biggest heroes. Yeah. And like, yeah, of course my work's influenced by this. Like it's just in the water supply. It's just what comes out. And so, you know, to, to have somebody point it out, I think he meant it to be a little derogatory. <laughs> Can't help but like agree. Like, yeah, yeah. I get it. Like, I, I see it too. <laughs> like, it's not. Uh, it's it's not hidden. It's right there. So yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's this the stuff I like, stuff I enjoy, and that's just kind of what comes out. Is there something like when you were a, a kid, like a young boy, young Corey, was was he influenced by either fantasy movies or books or like what pushed you in that realm specifically? Um, yeah, I mean, I loved the Smurfs. I loved like, <laughs> Thundercats. Um, <laughs> uh, like all this sort of stuff. I love Zelda, Mario, you know, like um, a lot of this kind of stuff I just really love. I love animation. Like for a while, I wanted to do concept art for, for animation. I wanted to do oh. character design. Yeah. Uh, and then kind of as I moved along the path, I, I kind of transitioned from, from wanting to do that more into wanting to like uh, publishing like children's books. That's kind of where I kind of diverged from where my head was at. Um, yeah, I mean, I love uh, animation. Um, I, I, and what's funny too, is, you know, having, having done all this Henson stuff over the years, I didn't see those movies until I was in my like late twenties, honestly, like mid, uh, mid twenties, really? uh, because I loved animation and anything. I like the Muppets. I like Kermit, but I uh, like, you know, there was a Muppet babies episode with Labyrinth. Yes. And so like, truly that was my first like <laughs> brush, with it. but I didn't see the movie until I was in my twenties because, um, I just loved animation and i anything with like people or like live action just didn't phase me um up until like jurassic park and i love <laughs> jurassic park uh that came out i was 10 when that came out okay and that was like the, the the perfect age for me um and so there's a handful of like movies that i really liked growing up um but mostly i loved animation and so 
any of that kind of stuff like uh, Beauty and the Beast um, mm. all that do you have a favorite animated movie I don't know that I could pick uh, <laughs> I could do like I could do like groupings like you know here's my favorite Ghibli here's my favorite like Disney Renaissance here's my favorite like classic Disney okay give like, me that give me favorite Ghibli favorite uh, Renaissance Disney okay and then favorite uh, one you've seen this year Okay. Uh, for Ghibli, I feel like it's the easy answer, but it's it's probably Princess Mononoke. Oh. Because I was 16 when I saw it, and I feel like it course corrected my imagination uh, and, yeah. and kind of shoved me into that like creature fantasy. Um, at the same time, I feel like I can tell most of what I need to know about a person by how they react to Totoro. <laughs> Yeah. And so, like Totoro <laughs> is like a litmus, like a, a, a personality litmus test for me. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, I adore Castle in the Sky. Um, yes. I love the like the the moment. Like I, I'll get choked up talking about it. But that moment where like um like the when the robot comes alive down in the basement and it's like destroying everything coming up and it, it finds Sheeta and she's standing on the castle and it like reaches out to her. Like I, I just adore that. Um, when they get up to the to the actual Lapida, like in the castle in the sky, like oh my goodness. Um, yeah. So those are probably my three favorites. I would uh, say that's probably the most underrated one too, because I always talk so highly of it, and people are like, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. I'm like, what do you mean you forgot about it? Like, I think, and especially the the granny character in that movie, I think yeah. is like top notch. It's, it's, it's those like air pirates. It's so yeah, it's, cool. Oh, I love. One um, just like this badass old granny, just with pigtails. I just I love her. I love yeah. her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as far as like Disney Renaissance, oh, yeah. Beauty, Beauty and the Beast is my favorite of the, that that era. Um, and then, I mean, I guess it depends on where you draw the the line for like what is the the Disney Renaissance mid nineties. Lilo and Stitch with that because Lilo and Stitch would be my my other favorite in that era um and then probably i remember being it's tough because i will never forget seeing the huns come up over the hill in mulan um my sister and i sitting there was just jaw dropping um that and then all of tarzan was just <laughs> the entirety of tarzan <laughs> by the 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 animation um just couldn't believe it um and then boosted by phil collins in the background <laughs> yeah but probably the lion king um yeah would be like my other pick from that because i i've, I've always loved the story i it's so the whole thing is so good and i think it um the bit where you know simba realizes he can't screw around in the jungle with his friends eating bugs forever and has to go back and make things right is such a it's 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 uh it's pretty powerful um i i, I admire it so yeah I totally agree well and your favorite animation movie this year who um I'm trying to think what, <laughs> what have i even seen uh probably <laughs> klaus um oh yeah i mean that was uh, we watched it like back in december but like klaus was like amazing like um the, on netflix was like incredible um yeah i'm trying to think if there's it's hard to like what have i even seen um i mean you know i wouldn't have seen it if i didn't have children but like now that i know about it i'd be happy to just watch it anyway it was um on amazon uh, tumbleleaf is incredible it's all stop motion one. um yeah tumbleleaf it's it's like really really beautiful great little stories um imaginative and kind of got this great feel oh. to it. <laughs> yeah double leaf so i have never heard of this <laughs> wait is this a movie or is this a show uh, it's a show i think there's like four seasons of it but it's it's really good yeah these chickens are cute <laughs> <laughs> i might have to give that one a try yeah the chickens is like rutabaga they've all got like um like whatever those kind of vegetable names it's really funny oh uh, that's great i believe put one out for tumble leaf yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Uh, this one's from Book Dust. Did you ever consider another career path, or was this always your dream job? And besides cop as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I probably, yeah, yeah, probably this is it. I mean, I can't, there's nothing else I've, I've ever wanted to do. There's nothing else I've ever been good at doing either. Um, that, you know, there's not much that like is in my wheelhouse. Uh, and so within <laughs> like that wheelhouse, whether it's like something in animation or like, you know, comics or like, mm -hmm. like picture books or things like that, I tend to veer towards um, like the publishing side. Um, but I do some animation, like it's not, it, animation stuff is so expensive that a lot of times I don't have clients that can like go with that kind of stuff. Uh, but when I do, I really enjoy it. And it's like either storyboarding or like creating art for animation, like that kind of stuff. Very rarely do I actually animate things on my own, but I've done, you know, some of it here and there. And it tends to be this kind of weird, like stop motion-y paper cutout kind of digital stuff. Yeah. Um, some of it's on my site, but like uh, it's, it's not too often that I do that kind of stuff because it's it's expensive and it's really time consuming and very time consuming uh, too many projects come along like that um, but occasionally yeah. yeah all right well then i have one final question for you right and it's the one that i've been asking all my art, art people that i interview at the end and that's what makes you happy Ooh, that's a very, that's, a, that's a big one um yeah. <laughs> in context of my work what makes me happy is when I feel like I have done something that I have not been able to do before, mm. or that was very difficult for me that I was able to just like do it. And it wasn't um, just that. There's also that, that immense satisfaction from getting, seeing an idea, getting a drawing, and then like, now I have it. Um, yeah. That's in the context of my work, I guess. Um, in general, I mean, I love my babies. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love, I love like my children. Um, I mean, that makes me happy. Is it like, I guess, what's your favorite thing to do with your kids? Is it like going to a park or just hanging around in the house? Just, just being with them. They're they are <laughs> funny. Uh, they are sh they are like, um, you know, like yesterday, my son, he's four. He, he loves like, he loves drawing. He loves doing little like projects and things. And he had this idea to make like um, telescopes. So he's rolling up paper and taping it and then decorating them. And he made like 30 of them. And he's like, I want to give these to all my friends. Cause like, he can't go see anybody right now. And so he made a box of them. And um, uh, my wife uh, um, took him for the afternoon drove around and like left him in every, like all his little friends mailboxes. And so he wanted to make these like spy glasses. And so like he came up with that all on his own and it's just what he wanted to do. And so like to see his, his burgeoning creativity is really, really something. Yeah. Uh, daughter is two, well, two and a half. Um, and she's just funny and like really goofy um, <laughs> and like super, super beautiful. <laughs> like, cause she looks just like my wife. Like she's got the same like dark curly hair and she's just like, you know, she's, she's, she's a mess. <laughs> you know, the baby's six months old. So he's just, you know, he cries all the time, but like, he's yeah. super, a very happy baby. He has to cry all the time. He's pretty happy. Um, so like, yeah, they're, they're like as sweet as could be. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in my work, when I feel like I've done something that I've meant to do, for yeah. whether it's something that I've had in mind for a long time or something that like I finally put together that thing that I've like been envisioning, um, you know, and whether that's like in the context of a larger project or whether that's just, here's a piece that I've wanted to, that I've kind of had in mind and now I've just finally done it. Um, like that, I get a big thrill out of doing that. I mean, yeah. I still think it's adorable that you're, your child created telescopes for all. Of yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll find a picture. I think I think we have, we got pictures of all his like process and stuff. Yeah, also. that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, right, he's, well, he's funny too because he he understands that like I do drawings and that's and that like makes money. 
And so I have like oh, yeah. over there just a bunch of coins, just like change. It's just kind of amassed over the years. And so what he likes to do is get us, like if he's ever down here with me, he'll get a stack of just like printer paper and just say, oh, um, if I do some drawings, we buy them. <laughs> and then, like do whatever, and do whatever. Uh, he'll like show it to me, like, do you want to buy it? I'm like, hmm, I'll buy that for like a penny. And so, like he kind of builds up his little coin collection. Uh, and I get a big stack of like, he gets though to where he's like, just scribbles them out, does them as fast as he can. Um, which I can, I can sort of relate to on some projects. <laughs> Doing it for the coin. Yeah. It's got I like build up my, uh, my piggy bank. So, yeah. Oh my God. That's amazing. And he's, how old did you say? Four? Uh, he's four. Yeah. He's four. Man, he's picking up on things pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah, he's, well, he's, you know, he's just, he's surrounded by all this. And like, you know, my wife's a director of an arts nonprofit. And so they, they have a, uh, um, one of their big events is they do craft festivals um, throughout the year. And they have like um, shops and things that they do. So like he's, you know, they're all just kind of surrounded by it. It's just kind of like he came, uh, you know, he comes to conventions occasionally. If, if it's like close enough show uh, to yeah. where like we travel, my wife will, will bring them in for the day and like they'll go out and do whatever during the day they're not they're not interested to like go to a convention but um not you know, yet they'll come in and like see me for a little while and then like you know, go off and do whatever yeah but, yeah um well you know. Corey, i just want to i really want to thank you for spending the time and taking this out of your day to just chat with me and have this interview yeah it's, it's been great man i because I, I feel like i'm not going to see anybody <laughs> this year i know <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to like say hey and like hang out for a little bit right so, i know it. it's kind of it's been fun like because obviously i see you and a lot of these other artists at conventions typically and that's right we get to catch up so right. in a weird way me starting up this whole interview thing i unintentionally realized this is like my way of catching up with the artists that i probably won't yeah. see this year yeah. so it's been really nice and I, I hope you're still working on the a secret personal project yeah, in fact, um, let's see. I don't know if you can see this table. It's my writing desk. Yeah, right so my head's there. blocking a little bit of it, but I can see the... the... Yeah, it's like a bunch of papers. So yeah, I've got kind of the, the big overarching project is is um, if there's 12 chapters to it, I'm 10, 10 chapters through it. So oh, wow. So it's like way, way into the end stages. Yeah, you're past the tipping point. You're like almost yeah. finished. Yes. Yep. Oh, well, congrats, Corey. That's really well done. I uh, thanks to you and thanks to uh, others like you who, who I've told about <laughs> these larger worlds and projects that will occasionally just say, hey, make sure you're working on it. It's a little poke every now and then. Yep. Every now and again. I mean, not that I think you actually need it. I feel like you're pretty self-driven. I feel like you're one of those self-motivated people that is, it's kind of rare in the art world to be yeah. this productive. So I give you kudos on that. Well, some, sometimes, sometimes you do it's cause it's very easy to go like, Ooh, I could, I could burn up a couple evenings, like grinding my wheels through the mud of like figuring this story stuff out, yeah. or I could work on a bunch of drawings and have something tangible to show for myself. And I know I would enjoy it. I'm not always enjoying the writing process. So it's, it's, that is a, a, a balance that I, I do find difficulty striking because like, yeah. I could just work on some sketchbook stuff, work yeah. on drawings. That's immediate satisfaction versus the delayed satisfaction of having a story that I'm proud of that is a lot more difficult to get to. So, well, and a lot of that immediate satisfaction, I think, is a very modern struggle with social media now so prevalent with artists where, like what you're saying, I could either muddle with the story and get some drafts done and, you know, do that or i could finish a sketch and be able to post it and get the likes and you know right. a good yep. job a pat on the back you know it's tough and yeah. you, but what's funny is the the stuff that we consider non-essential is actually the most essential when it comes to like building us or making a storybook like you have to do that stuff and writing yeah. isn't always the the easiest for a lot of art people but yeah. you got to train yourself just like art. Writing is a, a skill. It's a craft that you got to yeah. just train yourself on. And it's not going to be the most fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's so like, good hearing that. The thing, you know, it's like, I, I know how long it's taken to get at least to this, this good at drawing, like the thought, mm -hmm. 
as an all, not all that drawing skill translates into writing. Like it's, it's a lot yeah. of work. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Corey. Once yeah. again, everyone that's watching, I have links to all this stuff below. Please go check them out and please go follow them. And I definitely recommend this book. I think it's one of the most gorgeous hardcover books. <laughs> it's very beautiful called Visions of Wentz. I feel like I mispronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> okay i have such a northern drawl to everything i say that i always just assume i'm saying things wrong but i don't want to say something wrong when i have the artist and author with me <laughs> but yes thank you again it's been fun do you have any last lasting impressions or last sayings stay stay safe out there i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one i also hope you know i've been like keeping little notes of the little gems you've been dropping in this interview uh, there are some really good i really the one that's gonna really stick with me is treating an idea like a prism i yeah. love that and like looking at it from all different angles before just diving in like really yeah. observing it i like that yeah so, yeah i i found that that gives you that you see see you're seeing signs of an idea that you wouldn't otherwise see if you just go right i'm just getting into this yep just take it consider it look at and it's going to start suggesting things to you. Yeah. And patience is such a forgotten value, you know, on, on these times for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Corey. Yeah. I wanna, I, this, is, this has been wonderful and continue to do amazing things. You too, buddy. See you later. <laughs> All right. Take care.